Welcome to your sanity safe space with your favorite YouTube podcast duo. Skag 3, whoever he is. Get your clogged fascist ass out of here! Saving the millennial generation in weekly installments. You are a terrific team on all counts. Live from a castle tower and his mother's basement, this is, is the Matt and Blonde Show. I'll lead an effective strategy to mobilize true and international over to perk. <laughs> Hey, why the fuck is the gas so hot, bitch? I believe in the sand beneath my toes The beach gives a feeling and nothing feeling I believe in the faith that grows This is just a striking image to see the former president of the United States who was just booked in the Fulton County Jail behind us. Questions remained even within his team as of this morning whether or not this photo would ever actually exist, but there you see it. What was the experience like today in jail? Terrible experience. I took a mugshot, which I never heard the words mugshot. That was it didn't teach me that at the Wharton School of Finance. Hey, good. What the f is this? Have you seen Donald Trump's mugshot yet? I, I did see it on television. He could have smiled, he could have looked benign, instead he looks like a thug. And I think it's intended to be a sign of intimidation against the prosecutors and judges. It's not against the law, oh fuck you! It makes me sad. Yeah. It makes me sad to see a former president with a mugshot. I take no joy in, in seeing him booked into the Fulton County Jail. <laughs> oh man! I doubt it. You are fake news. You're a very, very silly person. Very fake news. You sound like a hysterical, bleeping, snowflake, lesbo bleep. That's a big game, man. Well, it's not my concern. All right, America, go to the YouTube right now. Big ups to Rebecca for keeping Matt woke. Congratulations <laughs> to both of you. You're awesome. I can't do it. We'll do it live. <laughs> Fuck it, we'll do it live. Hello and welcome to the show. It is a great show. It is a terrific show. It is a tremendous show. Frankly, the very best. You can ask anyone about that. People often do. I'm told this is the Matt and Blonde Show. My name is Matt Christensen. and I'm flanked on my right, as always, by my wonderful co-host, Blonde. Welcome. Hello. How much do you think Trump rehearsed the mugshot look, if at all? Was this? Uh, I don't know. It seemed, seemed pretty authentic. It was in perfect. the moment. I loved it. I even thought it was fake for like a few hours there. I was like, nah. There was a fake one circulating uh, Thursday yes. night that I am guilty of retweeting. I jumped the gun a little bit, but. Oh, no. It was so it close to. Pretty real. It was so close to the one that turned out to be real anyway, but the real one turned out to be better because it was more sinister. It was. And, and I, I yeah. just wonder, was this mirror practiced or was this on the fly? And I was I was expecting to get the traditional Trump pearly white grin that we're all accustomed to. And I thought that would be funny. But this is this is so much better. This is this angry so yeah. vengeance seeking look. It the made, memes. It, well, the memes are almost good enough to make it, you know, worthwhile for our entire country to fall apart. The memes are almost good enough to justify Civil War too, but I don't know. I might revisit that opinion. So, of course, we'll discuss the Trump booking in Atlanta on Thursday evening and all the reaction to it. Plus, uh, yesterday, there was a shooting at a dollar store in Jacksonville. And this looks like straight up actual hate of the week as of now. Uh, apparently, a guy with a swastika gun, swastika decorated yeah. AR, went in and killed um. black people. At the Dollar General. And and we know that he wanted to kill black people because he texted his dad and said, hey, I, I left a manifesto for you and for the media and for the feds. Manifesto. I'd like to read that, that their manifesto. Well, place your bets. Which one's coming out first? The, uh, the transgender shooter in Nashville manifesto or the uh jacksonville racist shooter manifesto yeah what is going yeah, on with never. Your, your focus it's know. like um we're we're never going to see there we're never going to see either of them i think i think this nazi one's going to come out because they want to hype that but do you we will visit the case uh we will recap a little bit of the republican debate um not a lot though it was mostly an event not worth viewing really i just want to laugh at chris christie that's my reason for bringing it up i'm so glad that he's in this event because he is the actual yeah. lol cow uh, for the yeah, production. Yeah. 
I don't know. Everybody's up the ass with this tiny little Pajit, but I'm not buying it. Uh, Ramaswamy. I, I'm I'm informed that the pronunciation is Vivek. Vivek. Seriously? Yeah. I've, oh, been, I've been saying this incorrectly this whole time. I thought it was Vivek. It is Vivek. Uh, also, later in the show, Ukrainian prosecutor Viktor Shokin, uh, you may remember him of son of a bitch, he got fired fame. Joe Biden describing how he was dismissed. He has broken his silence in an interview with Fox News, and he's saying, yeah, all of the allegations against the Bidens in Ukraine are true, as far as I'm concerned. So that's an interesting listen. We have hoax hate in the case of uh, a gay guy versus a weed sprayer. And that sounds <laughs> maybe a lot grosser than it actually is, but certainly a, a new form of hoax hate. And then an update in last week's pride flag shooting in California. Apparently that was legit too. Lots of hate shootings. It was legit. Happening. I mean, we were right about him being a minority, but he's Japanese. That was a surprise. Yeah, that was yeah. a surprise. Um, and before we get out of here, tonight's movie review is Silverado. So stick around for that. We'll catch up with your super chats in between topics. As always, 10 bucks and up on the Sunday show because we are no good low down money grabbers. Of course, it will be all this and more in your favorite couple hours of listening material. Remember, you can find everything show related and support the show for as little as a buck a month over on the website. That is mattchristiansonmedia.com or mattis.k. Listener support is hugely appreciated, and it is what keeps the show operational. So if you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the show. We also have merchandise for sale over on the site. Plus, we have offers from friendly listener-owned businesses as well. This week's feature business is our friends at Hero Soap Company. Do, do you love freedom? Do you love being clean? Then you'll love Hero Soap Company, made in the USA, chemical and fragrance free. A portion of each purchase donated to veteran and first responder charities. Initial subscription purchase is matched bar for bar and sent overseas to deploy troops. Let freedom clean. Hero Soap Company. That's right. When you try Hero Soap Company, not only are you getting a great smelling all natural product, not only can you subscribe and get soap straight to your door each month, but now you can get signature soaps designed by both of us. Blonde Signature Soap Oat Plus Almond is now available. It's the gentle exfoliation of oatmeal with a premium almond fragrance. Or, of course, you can try my two fine offerings. Timberline is a frosty pine experience where the forest meets the peaks. It's a woodsy scent with extra menthol for a high altitude cooling effect. Old West is the scent of sweet leather and oak barrels ready to bust open the saloon doors. Or, of course, try any of Hero Soap's other excellent offerings available in bar or liquid form and use promo code MCLISTENER for 10% off all Hero Soap products. That's 10% off our signature soaps, Oat Plus Almond, Timberline, and Old West, or any other products from Hero Soap using promo code MC Listener, You can find everything you need from our friends at Hero Soap, plus other great offers from the rest of our friendly listener-owned businesses, including Western Razor Company, Kineo Mountain Woodsmithing, Phoenix Ammunition, and more. That's at mattchristensenmedia.com slash deals. Deals by listeners for listeners. Uh, it has come to my attention, quick announcement, it's come to my attention that there are some maybe one maybe multiple i'm not clear but fake accounts impersonating me in the youtube comments really do you yeah. think they're bots or like this is delivery? it looks automated it's it's accounts that copy my mc logo and then respond to comments and say hey very very cool thought or thanks for sharing contact me on whatsapp with number one two three four five six mm. uh for Almost all of you, I'm sure you don't need me to explain that I am not posting a WhatsApp number for you to contact me with. There is no such WhatsApp number. Fake account impersonating me for some kind of scam, of course. Uh, if you do wish to contact me, all available methods of doing so are on the contact page of my website. MattChristensenMedia.com slash contact, which speaking of the mattis.gay new address that the listener purchased, I found out through testing, you can type in the slash whatever sub address and it still works. So you could do mattis.gay slash contact. It still goes to the contact page. 
That's oh, pretty cool. Nothing random. Like Matt is dot gay slash anal. Where is that? Uh, if I set up an anal page for my that site. That goes straight to your homepage. Uh, yeah, because it's just going to redirect. It's going to go back to the to the main page. You could do okay. slash literally anything and it'll go to the homepage. Matt is dot gay slash loose butthole. It should go to the homepage. homepage. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, you're just being redundant at that point. You just need Matt is dot gay. Anyway, uh, this has diverted into unnecessary territory. My point is, if you see these scam comments, number one, do not contact this WhatsApp number. Number two, if you would be so kind as to report them to YouTube, that would help us out. Though I doubt Raja Mohan cares all that much. Probably is Raja Mohan doing the scamming, actually. But <laughs> it's just Raja Mohan. Yeah. Stop just, calling people Pajits. <laughs> not, not only am I going to steal that 30% on the super chats that I dupe everyone into making, but I'm also going to set up a scam WhatsApp number to tell them that uh, I'm in desperate need of $5,000 to unlock a fortune left to them in a foreign country mm. or something like that. Anyway, uh, major news of the weekend is this shooting in Jacksonville. Uh, and it's, be, it's being called a, a hate shooting. It's being called a racist shooting. Uh, and uh, well, they're, the evidence for that is the markings on the gun and what we're told are manifestos, but we can't see the manifestos yet. But fed, to, fed, fed. I don't know. Maybe according to investigators, the shooter uh, was identified today as 21 year old Ryan Palmeter. I think that's how you say his name. Um, he is white. Uh, he He was apparently wearing a mask and body armor and wielding this swastika marked AR-15 as well as a Glock handgun. And he entered the Dollar, uh, Dollar General store in Jacksonville, Florida, after visiting a, a, a black college for a minute and then getting deterred, he went to this Dollar store nearby. Uh, more on his visit to the college campus in a moment. But he goes to this Dollar store and he apparently shot a guy in uh, fatally who was sitting in a car outside. And then he walked in and shot another guy. And then he walked in and shot someone else who had just entered. So he killed three black people. And I, and then a bunch of people fled the store. He remained in the store. When police arrived, they heard a single gunshot, which was mm. him killing himself. And according to Jacksonville Sheriff TK waters, uh, again, this was a hate motivated attack, not just because, white perpetrator black victims and this swastika gun but because the shooter they say left three manifestos describing his hateful motivations the shooter had authored several manifestos one to his parents one to the media and one to federal agents portions of these manifestos detail the shooter's disgusting ideology of hate plainly put this shooting was racially motivated, and he hated black people. He wanted to kill niggers. That's the one and only time I'll use that word. I'm glad I reviewed that clip before I played it. But geez, whoa there. You're going to get me in trouble with Mr. Mahan. Well, I read the transcript of this before I saw the video, and I was like, I hope that guy is black. <laughs> Good job putting up a black guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess. Fair point. Um but hey, can we see these manifestos? No, you cannot, at least for now. Uh, investigators have not released them. I am going to bet that we will see them much faster than uh, a certain Nashville trans school shooter manifesto. Though I would not be surprised to see these uh, released in the next few days. But we'll have to yeah. wait and see. It still uh, seems fatty, though, doesn't it? I don't we know, man. I mean, haven't I... had a lot of there. There is no I, I hear what you're saying. There is no shortage of Brenton. Tarrant like yeah. disaffected young men or people that hate black people. So, you know, I understand that it's very possible that this might be might be real, but like a Nazi emblem on a gun is it's kind of a little on the nose. Yeah, I can't even read what this text says, but to the point of authenticity, these are at least properly oriented swastikas, if not the angle these are 90 degree swastikas. They're not really the 45 degree. That's that because be the Fed on this correct. case watches this show. But at least up. the orientation is right. You know, it's S shaped. So there's that. Uh, but it says something like the file. There's text that he wrote on here. And I can't tell what the text says. Um, mm -hmm. So there's some some other 
something else he's he's trying to convey. Also, oh man, it's a it's a Palmetto State lower. Might be a, a Palmetto State complete rifle. Are they going to have to disavow? We'll have to see how. We'll see if they go after Palmetto State Armory like they went after Daniel Defense with the uh, Uvalde shooter and some of these other manufacturers. Probably. They went after Smith and Wesson for one of them too. Um, oh, and then don't forget Remington with um, the kid in Sandy Hook, Adam Lanza. That's right. So That's right. Um, some other facts of note here. Uh, the shooter lived with his parents 15 miles away from this Dollar General store in Clay County. Kind of unclear why he drove at least to the dollar store, but the dollar store appears to have been a secondary target. The shooter was first seen at nearby Edward Waters University, a historically black college. The shooter drove onto campus where he was confronted immediately by, by security and or campus police. Upon the confrontation, the shooter left and went to this dollar general store. I don't I haven't seen any reports of of gunfire exchange or anything more than like, who is this suspicious person? He should go away. And then he went away. But it is strange. You have to note how the immediate confrontation of a would be shooter deterred that shooter and made him leave. Something to think about in this particular case. Really? And basic security at the college. as well. Yeah, it sounds like they just basically monitored him and made him feel yeah, they were uncomfortable. Like, this guy seems weird. You can't come in. And he was like, I'm going to a dollar general. Uh, yeah. And uh, so as far as the shooters, uh, prior encounters with law enforcement, they're very minimal, but there are a couple. Um, he was, he, there was a 2016 domestic call to his home, did not result in an arrest. In 2017, he was temporarily detained for emergency health services under Florida's Baker Act law. I'm not exactly sure what the Baker Act is in Florida, but uh I'll have to look that up to find the exact details. Uh, unclear what caused these events, but uh, this this shooter would have been 14 or 15 years old at the time of those encounters. Right. So I can't, yeah. I don't know, you know, what he would have been alleged to have done. There's currently no evidence the shooter was part of any sort of group, which I don't know. I mean, in the context of of Fed involvement, where we've seen things like the Whitmer kidnapping plot. And uh, the Proud Boys and some other group like there's there's fed infiltration into existing groups and there's that kind of mm -hmm. facilitation. If this was some kind of like false flag or fed op, yeah. they're apparently going with the true lone wolf explanation, which is another thing that makes me skeptical that this is some kind of that this is this is not as it appears or it's some kind of fakery or something like that. Oh, so you're buying the official narrative. I, I've been duped by the feds. Yes. I, th I th I'm chalking this one up to probably legit, but uh, today it was um, also reported that the shooter legally purchased his two guns earlier this year, the Glock in April and the AR in June. The three victims are identified as 52 year old Angela Carr, 29 year old Gerald Gallian and 19 year old AJ Legary Jr. I might be pr uh, pronouncing that last one incorrectly. But that's all the super inf inefficient murder. Well, it sounds like what what happened because uh, that that was not to be excessively morbid. But when I thought your whole your whole thing was I'm going to go kill as many black people as I can, and your count is three before you kill yourself. Yeah, that's uh, like what happened here. And apparently, what happened is he ran into the store, and there weren't a lot of there was the guy in the car, somebody in the store. And then somebody who had just entered the store. So he had like three immediate opportunities. Everybody else bailed and he barricaded himself in the store or was locked in the store. Whatever happened, he was in the store until police arrived 10 minutes later. I'm unclear on why he wouldn't have chased people or why he remained in the store without potential victims in there. But mm -hmm. that's the story that they're going with. Or the story that happened. I guess I shouldn't sound so skeptical. It's just... That that did seem weird to me at the start. Like you're on a mission to commit a mass murder and you end up with three at a in a public setting with a rifle. Yeah. Anyway. Uh other big news throughout the week. Well, now they're saying that uh the, the Vladimir Putin's uh former assistant chef guy and then like uh Wagner group leader, and then for a moment, uh Putin coup leader. As we discussed back in June, um, what's his first name? Uh, 
Prigozhin. I already forgot his first name, but Prigozhin, they're saying not only are they uh, not as not only is it suspected that he died in this plane bombing, but Russia is now saying that he is confirmed dead by DNA analysis. Yeah, I'm not buying any of this. So Putin's come out and said that to journalists that although Prigozhin was a man of complicated destiny, this did happen. He did get down with um, with 10 other officials. And they're saying that they haven't like released the cause of it, but they have said that it is him based on DNA evidence, totally unconfirmed by the international community. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Uh, Viva and Barnes were talking about this earlier, but um, Prigozhin and Putin were buddies. He was like a loyal friend to Putin. So I think that he's probably living some lofty life in Russia. I, I, I highly doubt this. I mean, stage one of the conspiracy is being like, okay, uh, Putin down, downed the plane. Stage two is being like, they downed an empty plane and Krigozhin got it wealth beyond all of our wildest dreams for going along with this scheme. What's the third stage? Thinking that Putin is fake. Putin is Zelensky in a Putin suit. That Okay. Uh, yeah, three. I, I could entertain too. I, I could I could believe that this was uh, well, let me let me say there's video of the plane wreckage that looks legit to that me. That means to fuck me. all, though. But, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, not that such a thing could not be fabricated. But if if this was if they were to fake his death for some political reason, I could envision a situation in which you down a plane in the in the, in the way that this looks like it was. And you insist that he was on it and you just you fake a death that way and he lives out his life in uh, some sort of, I don't know, whatever, whatever circumstances he and Putin are looking for. Um, yeah, it kind of did work out perfectly. Um, well, so I'm, I'm highly skeptical of the story that's getting fed to the West. Putin is denying any and all involvement. So has has Putin said uh, what his what he believes to be the reason for the explosion that down the plane is or just the last nothing, I just read they're, they're still investigating the reason, but they didn't do it. Okay. Which I, I really think they didn't. Do, well, they did do it, but they didn't kill him. Yeah. Way. Okay. All right. So, uh, well, let's show us the DNA. Let someone else look at the DNA, I guess is what we have to do in this case. You've watched unsolved mysteries. Every time somebody tries to fake their own death, it's in a plane. Uh, I haven't watched. I mean, I, I've watched old death. '80s unsolved mysteries with Robert Stack, not the new stuff. Yeah. So yeah, there weren't people, a lot of fake deaths in that show. It was mostly just like this guy killed his wife and ran away type stuff. Killed his wife and then faked his death. I guess in a plane, but they know. never found a body. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know whose body they did find. Joseph Rosenbaum's because it was laying right there on the asphalt that day in Kenosha some right about three years ago to the day. Of course, everybody remembers Joseph Rosenbaum of Kenosha riot and Kyle Rittenhouse fame. But in case you forgot, he is the convicted child molester who first chased Kyle Rittenhouse down the street and grabbed Kyle's rifle and then was shot for his efforts. You may remember him from his famous, not last words, but close to last words, shoot me N-word. Shoot me, nigga! Shoot me, nigga! Bust on me, for real! He's you, the kid diddler, right? Yes, he was a convicted uh, child molester. Oh, okay. Of multiple kids. I think their ages were like 5 to 11 or something like that. This wow. was not this sort of situation where like, 22 year old guy dates a 17 year old, you know, and this, it was not that it was. And they were little boys. Too. I believe so. Yeah. Uh, you may remember him by his Ben and Jerry's memorial flavor fruit me N word. Uh, if only such a thing was real. I, uh, my wife and I were talking today about how we would certainly buy this flavor, you know, Ben and Jerry's as I've discussed, it's uh, it's fantastic ice cream, but it's made by dirty commies. So we do our best to avoid yeah. it. Um, if they it's actually made fruit me N word, uh, they've earned a sale. I'm back. In. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now the uh, the estate of Joseph Rosenbaum is suing Kyle Rittenhouse in a civil lawsuit, plus the Kenosha County Sheriff's Department, the city of Kenosha and several other government personnel and entities 
seeking compensatory and punitive damages for Rosenbaum's quote-unquote wrongful death. Even though his death wasn't wrongful at all. As we just saw, he literally requested that death. Please end my life with uh, a firearm projectile. And uh, that is what happened. But of course, it's not just that he said that. It, I'm not making that argument. The reason it was not a wrongful death is because he put Kyle Rittenhouse in grave danger and Kyle Rittenhouse was left with no choice but to defend himself. And so this is just impossibly ironic now. Uh, Rosenbaum was part of the mob burning those blocks down and he's now suing not just Kyle, but the police and other government officials for creating or at least not calming the dangerous situation that he was perpetuating. The police didn't do enough to stop him from creating the dangerous situation that ended up in the loss of his life. And just uh, in case you've forgotten the sequence of of events here, uh, Rosenbaum created the entire event. Now, Huber, the skateboard guy, and, and Gage Grosskretz, the missing biceps guy, I don't think that they were justified in attacking Kyle. I think that Kyle was running away and they were still pursuing and attacking him. And so Kyle had to defend himself from them too. But at least for those guys, they, they could plausibly say or try to say, well, we didn't know. We thought it was an active shooter right. situation. There was gunfire. We thought Kyle had committed the crime and we wanted to stop him and apprehend him. Joseph Rosenbaum has no such argument. There was no aggression ever committed. He just Joseph Rosenbaum attacked Kyle for really no reason, as far as we're aware. He just started chasing him down the street, and then he grabbed his gun, and that was that. So even though Gage Grosskreutz has uh, filed a wrongful death suit, or a wrongful, not death, he didn't die, but a civil lawsuit against Kyle Rittenhouse as well, I think the Huber family might have done that too. I can't remember. I think they did, yeah. Rosenbaum is the most preposterous because this is the Uh guy who all but single-handedly created the entire situation in the first place. If no Rosenbaum, there's probably no Kyle Rittenhouse event that night. So I I would like to believe this lawsuit is going nowhere, but, uh, you know, I'm forced to pay this guy's family. As as long as they give the money right back to those poor kids' families, the the poor (laughs) kids that Rosenbaum touched, maybe we can work out a deal that way. And touched is putting it kindly. I think the allegations are not just the allegations. The facts confirmed in a court of law are much more severe than just that. Oh, egregious violations of minors. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I got a kick out of floodgates. All these floodgates uh, on Twitter. I couldn't believe this. I got a kick out of this this week because the floodgates is always the uh, the border metaphor. Like all the floodgates Mm -hmm. are open. No, now it's literal. The floodgate. The floodgates are literally open. The floodgates. So the reason the border patrol admitted that they were going to do this and that they were doing it um, in order to ease floodwaters. And they're like, well, it hits any time between mid June and September. However, uh, the national weather service told border patrol, they're like the rainy season. It's not going to start until much later. You don't have to do this. And they're like, Ooh, okay. So this is so all they- under the premise of, of opening passageways for water that is going to arrive sometime soon. Maybe. Premise, you mean guys? Yeah. I guess, yeah. Uh, Indeed. Um, So they they actually welded these gates. Yeah, I saw that. 114 gates. And thousands have entered illegally. So it's not like at other places where supposedly you are supposed to just go to a border patrol agent or like a a little setup and be like, oh, I'm here to enter the country. No, like you just, just fucking walk in. Just walk in. And they don't know how many people, but uh, in this tweet that I was reading in this video, they're like, and 250 people have come through in the last seven hours. I was like, what? Oh, yeah. I have that clip, that <laughs> news story. I have I, I have yeah. that whenever you're ready for it. Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. Here's a here's a story uh, on the scene. 
The Tucson sector are seeing the most migrant apprehensions in a single day this week, making it the busiest sector. And it's in part because of this. The floodgates are literally open here in the Tucson sector. And there are 141 different gates along the southern border. And the majority of those are open. And the majority of those are open by the federal government. The Tucson sector is known for gotaways, for people trying to evade law enforcement. So they're not generally coming through an open door. Well, now they are. And they're doing it by the hundreds. Just this morning, Within a matter of hours, Border Patrol telling us it's nonstop. 250 migrants in just two and a half hours here in this sector. Two and a half hours? Oh, my God. That's even worse than I thought. Well, you know, they're doing this deliberately to demoralize the American public. That's what this is about. I don't I don't know how else what other conclusion to draw based on the uh, the welding imagery there. And uh yeah, you know, I gather if there if there's actual water that needs to be uh, that needs to be facilitated, I suppose I could understand. But uh, it does look awfully dry. I'm not uh, an expert on the environment or the uh, ecology of this particular area or any of that. But uh, well, they want they want the imagery of this to enrage people and piss off local landowners, uh, so that they start killing illegal immigrants, and uh, then they can use that for fodder for the election campaign. Everything does seem like deliberate provocation these days, doesn't it? This is this is this make this anybody that sees this and is not furious, I don't understand what's going on in their mind. Well, they won't even let Carlos Santana have his incredibly polite, well thought out outrage, actually. It was a great moment for about the five seconds that it lasted. In fact, as, uh, as far as I'm aware, I broke the news of his apology to you earlier today. You were still under the impression that Carlos Santana had said something obviously true uh, and and not backed off I was of like, it. That's so great. This old minority man just saying what's true because he doesn't give a fuck anymore. And then I read his totally conciliatory, groveling, publicist-oriented apology. You're right about that. It's just, definitely not write written this. by him, yeah. but I think that is the case in pretty much all of these celebrity apologies whenever they say something and back off of it. But th- this apparently actually happened in July. The video was circulating this week. It was a concert in New Jersey and famed guitarist Carlos Santana said between songs that uh, among other things, a woman is a woman and a man is a man. Where's the virtual reality? When God made you and me before we came out of the womb, you know who you are and what you are. Later on, when you grow up and you see things and you start believing that you could be something that it sounds good, but you know it ain't right. Because it a woman is a right. woman and a man is a man. Yeah. And then uh, yeah. the LMNOP outrage hit and Santana's publicist put out this statement on his Facebook account. It reads in part, quote, I am sorry for my insensitive comments. I realized uh, what I said hurt people, and that was not my intent. I sincerely apologize to the transgender community and everyone I offended. This is the part that gets me. I want to honor and respect all persons, ideals and beliefs, whether they are LGBTQ or not. Why would you? That's retarded. Why? It's honoring all beliefs that drives me nuts. Now, I might say like, hey, I... I respect your right to hold your view, but I do not have to honor that view. Why to honor all views is to honor none. Really? They're all the same. Of course. Nothing is true. Nothing is false. Any statement is as valid as the next. And so to Carlos Santana or his publicist, whoever wrote this, uh, to honor all views is to promote falsehood. There are views out there that are false that are bullshit. Right. If you honor them, that is at least tangential promotion. You, you can't say I honor all views without agreeing. I will promote falsehood. Yeah. But uh, such are the times. Falsehood must be enforced. Anyway, do you have anything else to say about uh, Mr. Santana? You know, I, I it would just be such a morale boost one time for somebody to be like, I just want to say 
go fuck yourself and apologize. <laughs> like just once, just, just can't, can't somebody just do that? Like you're old, your discography is complete. You're rich already. You're a minority. Just tell everybody to get bent. The, uh, the closest thing to doing that, I think is the, uh, is the Trump. Well, the closest guy to doing that is Trump. But as we see in the mugshot, they're about to put him in jail for it. So, you know, be careful what you wish for. Um, but by now, uh, everyone has seen, I'm sure, what may already be among the most famous photographs ever taken, Donald Trump's mugshot from Fulton County Jail in Atlanta after he surrendered himself on racketeering charges, among others, mm-hmm. on Thursday night. Now, I've seen some conflicting claims about the nature of whether this photograph was required or not. Legal experts speaking with the New York Post say Georgia law mandates this mugshot. Uh, Everybody, if you're charged with a felony, you must get a mugshot. That's what the experts in the New York Post are saying here. If you look at the Mm. law in Georgia, it says photographs need not be taken if it is known that photographs of the type listed taken um, within the previous year are on file. Right. So I guess it just depends um, what this type of, of photograph means and what on file means. But that language in the law implies there was at least some discretion here. It's not very hard to find a photo of Donald Trump. I think that the powers that be wanted the photo of Donald Trump. Does it help him? Does it hurt him? Was it done with the intent to help him or hurt him? I don't know. You could argue, I think both either side of, of those cases. Um, and and probably make some good points. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to get lost in that. Yeah. I just want to admire the meme glory of what this mugshot has uh, has established. Because it's the, like I said at the top of the show, it's this it's this thirst for vengeance in his eyes that has created this this wave of <laughs> <It's> enraged <laughs> yeah. this wave of great memes. Now, maybe it's just because I am a toddler parent. You tell me as a fellow toddler parent was. Did you like the are you pooping? meme because that Excellent. is the face oh yeah totally <laughs> the old squat in the corner trying to be private about it <laughs> <laughs> uh how about this one the homeless man watching me buy a lotto <laughs> ticket and a gatorade after i told him i didn't have change i've definitely been there <laughs> but in my defense it's because when i when the young happy go lucky me agreed to buy a hobo a sandwich with my first paycheck that son of a bitch said don't forget the pepsi and then you, know, you talk about what for you. you talk about what now your, you're Nazi, your red pill origin was. And it, of course, it took me many years after that. But and I know that's kind of a cliche <laughs> thing, but maybe that was the start of it. A hobo telling me after I agreed to buy him a tuna sandwich. Don't forget the Pepsi. What a son of a bitch. I should have I, I should have done exactly this. I should have bought the sandwich and walked out, taken a bite right in his face and had him give me a yeah. look like this. Uh, yep. This one, the view from inside the microwave. This is what your chicken nuggets see when you're microwaving them at three in the morning. They're looking out at you. Uh, Just a couple more. I I won't I won't drag this out too long. Uh, Those awkward moments when you're waiting for the cashier to process your bill. You know, you're waiting for the credit card to process and you got Taco Bell guy or wherever you are looking at you blankly in this way. Or even worse, the non-binary barista. When you buy the $13 iced mocha latte and uh, you select no tip because you don't want oh, no. you don't want to help. That's that so person. true. They always watch you. Most importantly, though, I, I mean, you could go through a list of hundreds of these that were a delight on Twitter for the last few days. Um, but most importantly, it's it's giving the country a little bit of unity. Whether you support Trump, whether you hate Trump, everyone loves this mugshot and we're all coming oh, it's together. great. Yeah. Which is great. You love to see a little peace and happiness and togetherness right before, you know, the Civil War, too, that this is uh, inevitably going to cause. So that, that's nice. And did you see the? I don't know who the person is, but this is according to a, uh, a, La- a Las Vegas local Twitter account. Some guy in Las Vegas got the Trump mugshot tattooed on his upper leg. Dude, it's a it's a pretty good tattoo. I actually didn't in think general, it was... I would say no. I would never do something like this. But as far as face tattoos go, yeah, it's not the worst one I've ever seen. I uh, I'm almost never a fan. I wouldn't say that I'm a fan of this, but when you're doing those 
photographic tattoos. Like I'm going to get a picture of my baby. Yeah. No, never do that. Too much detailed shading. It's not going to look right. The, the contour of your body is just going to make it look weird, especially if you gain weight or lose weight over the years. That face is going to get so weird and distorted. But all things considered, whoever did this one, I think they did a, about as good of a job of making yeah, that face yeah. look good on someone's thigh as possible. So if you're looking for tattoos in the Las Vegas area, maybe consult this person. And then um, so so Trump, uh, Trump's booking was very brief. It was about 20 minutes long. And then he left the Fulton County Jail and then he called into Newsmax and he said something just very classically Trumpy. He said he's never actually heard the term mugshot before. What was the experience like today in, in jail? Terrible experience. Uh, I came in, I was treated very nicely, but no, it's, uh, it is what it is. I took a mugshot, which I never heard the words mugshot. That wasn't, didn't teach me that at the Wharton School of Finance. And uh, I have to go through a process. It's uh, election interference, and it's a very sad day for our country <laughs> why do you think he did that i mean that's obviously not true maybe he did it to, to separate himself uh socially from the criminal class he just he just says weird things all the time like did you listen to the tucker interview it's just a trump i uh, know and mm. i like trump i have him as much enjoyment of trump as the next guy but he just says things in bizarre ways he was but talking I feel about like it's uh, more calculated do you think we attribute uh more um intent to him than he actually yeah i think some of that stuff is just it's stream of consciousness that does not have one of the best things about trump is he 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 doesn't necessarily self-censor he doesn't hide what he thinks but the other side of that is i think some of the stuff just comes out without intent or thought behind it one of my favorite sporty chess thing his, in the Tucker interview, he talked about how Al Baghdadi did ISIS, which I, I was just cracking up at the phrasing. Instead what did of he saying, mean? Like, he was the leader of ISIS. He he was behind ISIS attacks, that sort of thing. The phrasing was he did ISIS. We got he did ISIS, and we got him. <laughs> there were a bunch of how did that interview do? I can't believe I haven't watched it yet. I, I'm sure it's got millions of views, right? Well, according to the Twitter metrics, it's got a couple hundred million views. Now, you know, as everybody's disputing, what counts as a view on Twitter is like a couple seconds in your on your phone. So I'm sure it's not. I'm sure the viewership is not as high as it's being presented. I'm also sure that the viewership is pretty high. I'm 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 sure it probably is in excess of the debate, which we'll get to later. Um, I but in fairness, I I did not find a lot of value in the interview. That's one of the reasons I cut it from the show tonight. I was like, I just didn't feel like there was any new information. I was information. pretty excited about it. And then I completely forgot to watch it. It was, this was like it's, four days ago. wasn't It's it? worth um, listening to, I suppose, if you're interested in presidential politics or maybe just the state of law and justice in this country, since it was taped shortly before he was booked in Fulton County. But there was 261 million. Views. There was nothing in there that I felt like, oh, oh, that's a revealing moment or that's a piece of information that I didn't have before. Or that is, I don't know, there wasn't even a lot of controversial stuff in there. It was it was pretty to be fair. Vanilla. That's how I felt about the debates. So, well, yeah, he's not really on the back foot because of this. Uh, no, I don't think he he's it cost him anything. I just don't think. I, I, I just personally did not find a lot of value in the interview, but that's OK. Anyway, um, uh, maybe a potential area for some interesting developments. Uh, Trump agreed to these bail terms on Monday. He is um, he's not allowed to make any threats, direct or indirect, to witnesses or other co-defendants in the case. And you got to wonder, well, what's that really getting at? Are we talking about like Trump calling up these people and saying, I'm going to kill you or something? No, we're talking about him whipping up the internet mob on social media. That's what we're talking about. He's also barred from speaking about the case directly or indirectly with the co-defendants or potential witnesses, unless lawyers are present. Uh, If Trump were to violate these terms, again, the most likely way of doing that would be uh, a disrespectful truth social post. He, he possibly could be thrown in jail the experts quoted in this Reuters piece say that would be extremely unlikely to happen over something like a social media post. But the point is, there are 
the, the judge does technically hold that power and there are now terms that could potentially have that effect. So just something to keep an eye on because uh, I don't I don't think uh, as it relates to this case or any of the others that Trump is facing that he's going to shut up on Truth Social anytime soon, even if his lawyers tell him to. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, Biden, Joe Biden, meanwhile, he was uh, he was on vacation in Lake Tahoe as Trump was booked. And this was right after he finished his trip to Maui, telling those devastated families that he knows exactly what they're going through because one time lightning struck near his house and almost burned down his stack of classified documents that he had stored next to his 67 <laughs> Corvette. And his cat. And his cat. Uh, yeah. I, I, I wanted to talk about that, but it happened on Monday and I figured, well, people have seen this. Everyone knows that's, about it. Yeah. That's too old. So I cut it. But uh, but yeah, so Biden went from from Maui to his vacation in Lake Tahoe and some reporters caught up with him and they asked him on Friday if he'd seen the mug shot. And Joe, uh, Joe said yes. And Trump is a very handsome guy. Have you seen Donald Trump's mug shot yet? Uh, I, I did see it on television. What do you think? Handsome guy. What wonderful guy. Uh, it, it, you know, it's always uh, hilarious when your uh, your political opponent is being arrested and charged on dubious terms. That's yikes. You know, just uh, a tongue in cheek thing. And even if you think I'm being unfair about that particular moment, that he's not treating it particularly seriously. Uh, the tweet that he, that his account put out, it appears that he was fundraising off of the arrest of his political rival. How do you say this? Apropos? Uh, that's a word I never use in everyday discussion. That is correct. Apropos of nothing. I think today's a great day to give to my campaign, Joe Biden said. So... What he's saying is this is a reference to nothing in particular, but you should give me some money. Notice the timestamp because it wasn't just on Thursday. It was at 730 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday, the exact scheduled time of Trump's surrender, which was announced publicly prior. So whether it was Joe himself or the people around him, they thought it was a good idea to put out this tongue in cheek, smirky, uh, fundraiser tweet at the time Trump is getting arrested to capitalize politically off that in actual dollars. They're, they're pointing and laughing as they're doing this. So, uh, well, that's why Trump had the vengeance look in his eyes that he did, but, uh, we'll see how that goes. Did you see that, uh, a bunch of evidence emerged this week or examples of, of Fannie Willis, Herself questioning election integrity in actually the same election in many cases in 2020. She was sitting there just like everybody at election night. Like, what is up? What is this pipe bullshit? Someone needs to get in there into these uh, Atlanta polling locations and and clean this shit up. But uh, yeah, we have Fulton County DA Fannie Willis, of course, the woman prosecuting Trump for his uh, what she says is his conspiracy to overturn the Georgia election results. But she's got this history of frequently questioning election results herself. Benny Johnson scraped some of her social media, specifically her Facebook account, found several of these posts. This one on election night in 2020. Georgia could determine who is our next president. A team of lawyers needs to watch them count every single vote. They can start in Fulton where they're having water leaks. What ballots are they throwing out? Georgia, let's give an honest accounting. No stunts. This is a Trump tweet. It's... It's got the short, the short sentences with the exclamation point exactly the same way Trump would do it. Oh my sentence gosh. fragments, I guess. Not really a complete sentence, but uh, also did tw- she delete this? I think they're still up. Or if she deleted them, it would have been only after Benny Johnson recovered them this week. So they were still up as of this week. Yikes. They were still up after charging Trump. Another one from uh, shortly after the election in 2018. Remember, this is the one in which Stacey Abrams lost her uh, race for governor to Brian Kemp the first time. She says, "Okay, I'm watching whatever this channel is. And this guy um, says, request all ballots in Fulton County be counted again to make sure all votes are counted. The other commissioners sat silent. No other commissioner seconded 
his motion. Ask yourself why. You all better start paying attention to what is really going on instead of reality TV and pay attention to reality. Hashtag shaking my damn head. She also, I th- if I'm understanding this post correctly, this one on Facebook after the 2020 election, I think she's saying that it's her belief that that 116 percent of registered white voters voted in Fulton County, mm-hmm. which was a claim uh, that the Trump team was making about. I think it was in Pennsylvania where they were making this claim that more registered voters, more people had voted than registered voters registered that voters exist. Yeah. So she's making something of a similar claim there. Granted, these these charges um, or the charges against Trump, they're not just about questioning election results. The claim that Fannie Willis is making is that there was an organized criminal scheme to actually overturn the results, which Fannie Willis didn't do, apparently, or at least as far as I'm aware. But uh, two things to consider. Number one, uh, you actually do have a right to question election results. So if Fannie Willis can do it, Donald Trump can do it. But B, you also have a right to pursue legal challenge to those election results. So Fannie Willis is going to have to show A conspiracy to do something else, not a conspiracy to work within the legal framework and the legal process, but a conspiracy to work outside the legal system. Can she show that on the facts? I don't think she can. But if she has a Fulton County jury to work with, I'm not sure the facts are really relevant. So this case remains. I I uh, remain very concerned about this case, not just as as it exists politically, for Donald Trump, but I just mean the prospect of this for this case to to do something serious, like put Trump in prison or have some serious consequence that will cause very serious conflict. Yeah, I'm still I'm still really worried about this one. That has to be their intent, though. Uh, yeah, it, uh, to your point on poking the bear, it seems like this is another episode of the poking. Yeah, but at some point, it's not it's no longer prudent of us to be like, well, we have to remain calm and withdrawn in this situation. At some point, we have to be like, all right, uh, poke the bear too many times now. Well, that's what worries me about this case. If it is determined that Donald Trump must must surrender not just to booking, but to prison and Donald Trump and company decide, "Mm, no, not doing that. And some people give him refuge for him not to do that. And. There's some sort of police force or federal marshals or something like that sent to apprehend him. And then there are guns pointed between people who want him detained and people who don't. And uh, yeah, yeah, that that's the circumstance. That's that is the trajectory on which we are headed, whether it happens in the, the Atlanta case or in some other case. It appears as though they are intent on that confrontation. Wouldn't it be something of a relief, though? Uh, well, um. I've been to the extent they demand uh, civil war blue balls for like 10 years and I'm sick of it. I, I don't like, want do it that. or not like, do it to be clear. Yeah, I don't want that. I want nothing to do with armed conflict domestically, but yeah, we're not if, asking for this. Look yeah. at what they're doing. Well, um, to that, I would say maybe, uh, I would say don't get your hopes up, but that implies the hopes are that, um, what I worry about, I guess my question is, in my scenario, if Trump was actually, they were trying to get him to surrender to a prison sentence. Um, And I I envision a scenario in which there's a group of people who say no and a group of people who say yes, and there's going to be some kind of conflict between them. Maybe that premise is bunk. Maybe the people who would actually put up a fight to say no. Maybe we would maybe we would lay down for that, too. We've laid down for a lot over the last few years. That's true. So uh, maybe I don't I'm know. Wrong. I think that maybe this that... idea of an armed conflict is something of a of a pipe dream for us. Well, as well, maybe the situation is that Trump does get apprehended with maybe some sort of minor conflict. And then instead we continue down the course of, OK, OK, but we got them in 2028, man. The American people, all the independents are going to look at this unjust imprisoning and they're going to think we're going to punish the Democrats this time. Yeah. Instead, you know, you have the ballot harvesting, you have the structures in place that make voting um, much more skewed toward the Democratic Party than it used to be. And of course, you have a mountain of federal government entitlements and other involvement in the day to day lives of, Amer- of Americans that makes people kind of enjoy sucking on that teat, even if that teat is incredibly abusive. You still get your 
I don't know how I want to phrase that. You still you still get your your perceived benefit. I'm not going to use anything more graphic than that. Uh, yeah, but everybody's just acting like, okay, like this Oliver Anthony thing that's gone totally viral. We haven't talked about that at all, have we? Not much. Incidentally, um, in passing. That's the kind of outlet that Americans want. They want like some guy to talk about how America is a melting pot and then to sing a song about how he's drinking himself to death and he's super poor. And they're like, I relate to you. But are people really ready to get into an armed conflict with a bunch of GD commies? I don't know. Well, it's not uh, it's not bad enough. But the problem is that they're going to keep making it bad enough until it is bad enough. You get what I'm saying? Like there are, there are a lot of comforts in the modern world, but those comforts can be erased. And I think we're dealing with people who are intent on erasing many of them, making you dependent. Yeah, but but they can be erased for the left too. Ah, uh, yeah, but w- yeah, when it's when it's a, a mutual effort, that's a that's a race to the comfort bottom, and so eventually that that threshold will be broken. But Ugh. anyway, a couple of quick notes before the top of the hour on the Trump stuff. Uh, just a couple pieces of news about the well, one specifically about I think what is. Potentially some evidence of additional corruption in another piece of the Trump prosecutions. The New York Times, uh, the New York Post, rather, reported Saturday that White House lawyers and other members of the administration met with special counsel Jack Smith's team ahead of the classified documents indictments. Of course, Jack Smith is this, the federal special counsel handling the classified documents case and handling the January 6th case. According to the Post, just weeks before the indictment, this trial... Uh, this top aide to Smith, his name is Jay Bratt, was at the White House attending meetings. And this isn't even according to anonymous sources. This is according to uh, records obtained from the White House visitor logs. Now, we don't know exactly what was discussed, but it's certainly valid to question why a top aide for the supposedly independent special counsel's office would be meeting with White House lawyers not so long before an indictment was issued against the White House's top political rival. Mm. Uh, Peter Carr, a spokesman for the special counsel, said Brett was at the White House for a quote-unquote case-related interview, but declined to comment further. An anonymous source with knowledge tells the New York Post uh, that this was an interview of a career official who was also working at the White House during... uh, during the Trump administration. So this apparent they're saying they were interviewing a guy in the white house counsel's office who was still there. They're conducting witness interviews about Trump's classified documents case with some sort of white house lawyer who was there during the Trump administration and is still there today during the Biden administration. Maybe there's less turnover than I realized. That seems like a very short list of people to me, but there, mu- I guess there must be at least a few. Even if this is accurate, let's say like, oh, there's some there's some lawyer in the White House counsel's office who would handle things like declassifying classified information. And maybe that person is less political and just carries on in that role throughout various administrations. Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be more prudent if you're in the special counsel's office to say, hey, guy from the White House counsel's office, would you come down to. I don't know, maybe not the White House to have this meeting (laughs) just to erase any perception of people speaking with each other at the water cooler in the White House. Mm -hmm. That step was not taken. That's what's so suspicious about this is like, even if I buy your explanation as plausible, uh, there's a lot of people you might talk to in the White House, isn't there? Mm -hmm. It seems uh, a little a little odd. Also, um, We have some development, potential development in the effort to just make Trump ineligible to be on the ballot or to be the president at all. I also saw Congressman Jamie Raskin talking about this today on one of the Sunday shows. So maybe they're going to try to give this theory some legs. But ever since January 6th, we've we've heard this legal theory repeated that Trump could be declared ineligible for the presidency by virtue of the 14th Amendment, which prohibits anyone who is engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States from holding federal office. Now, of course, that was refer- that was written with reference to Confederates during the Civil War. 
we're going to act like Trump on January 6th is the exact same thing. Even though Trump said go protest peacefully and patriotically and not go engage in violent rebellion. But Lawrence Kaplan is a tax attorney in Palm Beach. And he's now starting the legal effort to ban Trump from the presidency on this basis. So he's filed a federal lawsuit. And he says in part, quote, the bottom line here is that President Trump both engaged in an insurrection and also gave aid and comfort to other individuals who were engaging in such actions within the clear meaning of those terms as defined by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Assuming that the public record to date is accurate and we have no evidence to the contrary, Trump is no longer eligible to seek the office of the president of the United States or any other state of the union. Now, is this lawsuit going to go anywhere? Probably not. I'm, I'm I would like to think, but I do. I, I want uh, a lawyer or someone with some knowledge to explain to me how the hell does this guy have standing? Because mm-hmm. he's just a guy. And by standing, I mean the the proper position to bring a valid lawsuit. When Biden violates the Constitution routinely. In 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 every case, it can't just be some rando who files the lawsuit. It's got to be someone with standing. Standing being a direct personal stake or injury. That was a, a, a hotly contested piece of the student bailout uh, case. The, the student loan bailout case at the Supreme Court. Elena Kagan uh, dissenting and saying, these people don't have standing. They're not directly connected to the lenders. They can't bring the lawsuit. In all these cases where Biden does overtly unconstitutional bullshit, we tell randos, you can't sue just because you're a rando who says it's unconstitutional. And yet here's a rando bring a federal lawsuit, a federal challenge to Trump's eligibility solely on the basis that he says it's unconstitutional. Now, I, I don't think he's correct as a matter of law, but how does he have the standing to bring this when everyone else who wanted to challenge the student loan bailout or other things that Biden has done? Like if I'm just a guy who doesn't like Biden's pistol brace move with guns, I don't own a pistol brace. I don't even have any guns, but I just think that's a violation of, the second amendment or, you know, the, the, the alphabet agencies having too much authority beyond the law that Congress has written. They'll tell me to get the hell out of court. You don't have standing. I mean, some substantial credentials will emerge upon scrutiny for this guy. I'm sure he's not doing this um, organically. He was chosen for this position. Maybe he has I'm some sure. thing like, I would think that the we'll only out. people that could do this would be like, I don't know, the Democratic Party or the Joe Biden campaign or something like that. Well, isn't it? Isn't it the Democratic Party or the Joe Biden campaign? This guy isn't just some guy. He was chosen by the Democratic Party. No, no, you don't understand. You you scroll down in the story and he says uh, he is not an overtly political person. See, he's Uh, not. um, He says his first job at a loss. What do you think he's getting out of this? Okay, here we go. Here we go. How, How could you be suspicious of him? He said his first job out of law school was working for the NSA. I mean, that's as non-shady as I could imagine. So nobody could say that I'm not a patriot, he said. And he he has voted Republican in the past. So Yeah, so that that means fuck all. Yeah. Anyway, uh, well, I'll keep an eye on that as it develops. And as I mentioned, at least one Democrat in Congress is is buying and promoting this theory. So we'll see if they, they go with it. Anyway, we're past the top of the hour, though, so we should get to our chatters and take a break. I have to pee so bad. Oh yeah. my God. I was right about to, to say too? I, it's unprofessional as I was lectured for previously, but I this is a, am 20 weeks pregnant. I know. So you're going to let will, me go first. I will. I just couldn't believe that. I don't think I've peed for like 40 shows and this is the one time, but I'll allow it. Sorry, bud. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Female I'll, privilege. Let me, yeah. Let me catch up with, uh, with rumble here. Mike David Smoke Show says, hey, Matt, tell uh, your guys at Hero Soap to make laundry detergent. As a man, I hate everything on the market. Makes my clothes smell like gay Hawaiian unicorn taint. Uh, I, I could I could put in the good word. I'm not sure what the technicals about making laundry detergent would be, but perhaps they have the ability. Um, I don't know. I guess um, I've never really thought about the scent of my laundry detergent. I just use the like generic arm and hammer stuff from Costco. I don't, I don't, I don't get anything fancy, but I don't want my, my clothes smelling like gay Hawaiian unicorn taint either. Uh, Thank you for supporting the show. JD 1492. 
What do you think a Trump candidacy would have looked like in 2012? Did Obama know he was uh, the biggest threat to his second term back then? Was the correspondence dinner in 2012 politically relevant? Yeah, that was the time. Was it the 2012 time when when Obama did that mic drop moment where he says at least one of us will be a president? Was that the 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 White House correspondence or was that on Jimmy Fallon's show? Might have been on Fallon's show. Um, I don't know. Would I? I think Obama, rightly or wrongly, was probably too oh. powerful of a candidate. I don't think Donald Trump could have beat Barack Obama in an election. Do you? Not a chance. No, no way. The question here is what would have happened if if they would have faced off in 2012? Mm. Um, Obama did fall back a bit from his 2008 performance in, in 2012. But yeah, I, I don't think uh, I think Trump benefited greatly from from the unique dislike for Hillary Clinton. And mm -hmm. even though Obama, I think, is every bit the bad guy, quite possibly more so. Um, I think that he was too powerful of a politician. He was so well yeah. liked by too many people. I don't think Trump could have eclipsed that personally. You know, a piece of um, the Obama president, uh, the Obama uh, campaign history just developed over the weekend. Remember Joe the plumber? Oh yeah. He died. He just died. Oh really? He was 49. He died of pancreatic cancer within the last few days. Are Young you man. sure he didn't, Oba uh, he didn't uh, die in eight feet of water at Obama's? I don't Yeah. I don't know. I, he was hanging out with Obama's chef for a while. So who knows what happened there? <laughs> That's a bummer. Pancreatic cancer just yeah. wipes people out. Uh, let me finish up these on uh, rumble and then I will take my, uh, my much needed unprofessional break. Yakko 1977 says oddly Trump having a mugshot is getting him some support from the black community. It's street cred or something. In other news, no clients from Epstein's Island have been indicted or has a mugshot. That is true. Yeah. And I did see the various street attendees when Trump's motorcade was passing by. And, uh, and yeah, I, I noticed that the news was quickly looking to pan away from, certain shots that may have looked more demographically diverse than they would prefer to highlight. It seemed like some of that was going on. Hmm. Haughty Twerkman says, why was Hunter Biden appointed to the Amtrak board? Hold on. Got to get my rim shot ready. This seems like a good one. Why was Hunter Biden appointed to the Amtrak board to run crack trains? Actually. <laughs> oh, those are like. Uh, that one might be over my head. I mean, I get the crack. But run crank trains. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, at this at this rate, it's not even going to be a joke. Hunter Biden is going to be on the Amtrak board very soon. And honestly, I bet uh, Hunter Biden might be able to run Amtrak better than the people who are currently there. <laughs> you can't do much worse. Yeah, really. When the trains overturn, they'll just be filled with drugs. And that won't be as big of a deal for society. Mike David Smoke Show says, Blonde, if you want a celebrity that doesn't back off at all, go watch some interview clips of Ted Nugent. That's true. P.S. Oh, yeah. I still say we need to get Matt doing album reviews. I appreciate the uh, the encouragement, but if you think the movie reviews bring vitriol, just wait until music reviews. Yeah. No, I won't do it. Yeah, I'm going to pass on I that. Quit. I quit. I quit. Did you get all the ones over on uh, Rumble? I'm doing the last one right now. Laughing oh, Boy sorry, says, uh, Matt, answer the knife question. Answer to the knife question is a SOCP dagger or other... I'm going to mispronounce things here. Karambit style knife with a close contact shooting course that will tell you where to stick it. Neck armpit. <laughs> tell you where to stick it. Neck armpits, inner thighs, any place you can. Um, yeah. Maybe that would be an opportunity too. It's one of the things that's that I've, I've talked about a lot in recent weeks. Like, uh, you know, there's firearm proficiency training and tactical training. And I think those things are important. There's also just like hand to hand combat, like knowing how to fight a guy. If you had to fight a guy, what would you do? I don't have a lot of uh, experience in the techniques. And as far as stabbing a dude, I'm j I'm, I would take a guess. I think I could make some good guesses, but I don't have you know, any kind of formal training in something like that. Wouldn't you want to get it between the ribs? I don't know. I feel like I, if you try to stab somebody in the sternum, it, I, I, I wouldn't be able to reach that. Yeah, I, I would think that you want to avoid bones. Or stomach. Yeah, you want to hit vital organs. You want to hit major arteries, whatever. The stomach just... Ch -ch -ch -ch. Yeah. That's what they do in prison... TV shows, right? Anyway, I'm taking my break and I'm coming right back. Wicked masshole. I know that the hypothetical is tossed around regarding the show and many others, but what would you actually do 
if you had a buck a month from every subscriber. Oh man. Well, we'd hire some help, I think. Um, gosh, what would we do? I wish Skag were here. Maybe I'll re-ask this question when he comes back because I'm I'm sure he has a better answer than I do about uh, about what we would do. Um, maybe we would get a panel on every once in a while. We'll see about that. Um, I bought PN. No note. Thank you, sir. Robin D. Banks. Matt and I once made love, after which he shot his rope on my mug. Just found out about the J-Bill thing. Apparently, this time, the white supremacist is, is actually white. Not sure what to expect anymore. Whatever. We'll find out that he's like half Mexican in a year or something. Um, thank you, Eric. Holden Mulray. Hi, true seekers. There's an old trope of delusional people pretending to be Napoleon. I guess today we provide them Napoleon affirming care and whip out the types, the tights, the hat and the bone saw. Yeah, really. We probably would. Um, Peter Edwards, Matt and I never once made love. Thank you. You're the least gay person that has written into the show today. I so came Wicked back Mantle, right at the right time. <laughs> Wicked Mass will ask what you would do if we actually had a dollar a month from every subscriber. Oh, uh, I would hire people. I, I would, I, uh, I would hire and not just for like, you know, administrative stuff, like handling emails and scheduling things. I would like to hire people for high level production, like going places to interview people and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. You know, do some Tim cast stuff. Um, I don't know. These panel shows are doing so well. I find them mildly infuriating but they are the internet blood sports of 2023. They're just killing it. There are a lot of them. And I feel like I'm not taking shots at those shows. Clearly they are hitting something that people value because they have massive audiences for me. Um, they certainly are like, I see, I guess I see why people find entertainment in them, but for me, they're a little, they get a little messy. It's too many people. It's talking over people. Certain people tend to dominate. Others hardly talk at all. And then there's just kind of a lot of squawking. And yeah. that's why it doesn't really work for me. But I, I feel like I'm in the minority because it apparently works well for a lot of people. I do love interview shows. Like almost yeah, like a really, a really great one on one interview. Yeah. So if we could made a dollar a month for every subscriber, we could pay people to come on the show. Yeah, that'd be cool. Like big names. Yeah. We'd be like, and culture will give you five thousand dollars if you talk to us for and culture will do it for five bucks these days. No, she won't. We've emailed <laughs> her a hundred times. Well, she's just holding out then. She's only worth five bucks these days. No, oh, poor Anne. <laughs> Never forget that she shifted the Overton window. Hmm. Uh, maybe more than anybody else in the twenty fifteen election. Twenty sixteen. Uh, in 2015, she was famously talking about how Trump was going to get elected and everybody laughed. She, she was prophetic on that. I'll never forget that Bill Maher moment. Yeah. Mm. Osephus, hear me and rejoice. Dick Sexenhammer has his official clank and grave spoon for sale on the bay. Man, blind, do you have any utensils you could put up for sale? Don't let Hex and Musk make all the money. Sure, I will put up um, my melted spatula for $1 million. Melted spatula? What did you do? It's not melted. It's oh. just very well used. No, uh, one of the things on my long list of um, things to return to, things to improve, things to work on for going into the fall here, I expect to have some additional opportunity and or resources to do some of those things. And revamped uh, merch, uh, merch store, inclu mm -hmm. including like not just new graphics for things, but like maybe more creative items is something that I have on my mind. So, And maybe and as we've discussed, a way to get some audience involvement in that too. And that's um, true. And a way to create uh, business opportunities for other people, too. It's like if, if graphic designers create something that is a successful design, like, yeah, I want them to get their cut of that and I want them to get rewarded. So I'm thinking about it. I can't do anything for the ne for right now. But those are things that are on my mind. This is the difference between men and women. I'm like, how am I, you know, I'm 20 weeks pregnant. I'm like, how am I going to maintain the very little career that I have going on when I have another child and you're like, I want to build blah, da, 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 and build this and expand this and blah, da, da. like, I, I'm not thinking about any of this. Well, someone has to take care of the kids though. And uh, that is uh, its own very important role. I, I saw the audience. There was a great article. I forget what publication it was in, uh, but it was, it was recent and it was, it was coming full circle on this. It was like, Oh, what, it, what was the headline? It was something like, will the, will the high costs of childcare 
force women to take care of their own kids or something like that. And it was just framed in this way like, oh, I, I'm being I'm put in this unfortunate situation of caring for my own child by the nature of the market that has forced me here. It's like, so no, asinine. we changed the default. We made the default this weird right. backward career woman thing. Yeah. And now we're returning to more uh, a natural norm. To get good childcare, think about how much of your income would, would have to contribute to that. Well, yeah. I mean, it would just be impossible. We've talked about uh, one of the things we've considered or at least done the math on is like, would it be worthwhile for my wife to go back to what she used to do for health insurance or other things? Generally speaking, we would pay as much for childcare as she would be earning anyway. So it ends up being kind of a wash. But there's costs to consider, too. Even if we made money by, or, or saved money on the health insurance, there is a cost of some other weirdo taking care of your kid every day. Yeah. That's a cost. Can you imagine dropping your kid off with, with some random lady that had no vested interest except for like minimal financial interest in doing the, the, the minimum to maintain. Uh, yeah. I mean, in a situation where we, we economic circumstances demanded it and I had someone I really trusted, you know, like my, my parents or something. Yeah. I, I, I could envision that, but where it's like, you just hire, hire out a childcare lady down the street who had a good yeah. Yelp review or something. Uh, yeah, I'll pass. Uh, let's just do one more right now. Boogie Man 917 says, I doubt it. Thanks so much. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys very much. We will come back to your chats at the end of the show. I'm so bummed that this um, interview I'll have to just circle back with you. Watching it. Well, I mean, don't take my word for it. Watch it and decide for yourself. I just I hardly heard anything about it. I didn't even hear enough about it this week that reminded me to watch it. Yeah. I, Although I, don't think... I was it was highly anticipated. Yeah, uh, it didn't it didn't do a lot for me, but uh Maybe you'll find some value. It's not very long. It's only like 45 minutes. So it's not like you're committing uh, an insane amount of time. Anyway, I mentioned that I wanted to get into some debate recap just briefly. So I will do that. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it because, uh, well, at least until further notice, I don't think it's going to do anything to change who's going to win the Republican nomination. Uh, and I, I do see value in letting the ideas compete regardless. I think it would be better uh, in many ways if Donald Trump was on the stage, not just entertainment, but for the sake of letting these ideas compete and all of this that. This wasn't letting ideas compete. But my friend likened this to um, like WWE wrestling. And I was like, that is so exactly <laughs> I, what's going on. I would rather watch the wrestling. I think. It was just such a spectacle. With and nobody really had substantive ideas that they were hashing over in a meaningful way. They didn't even talk about inflation. That's uh, well, that was the first point that I wanted to make. It, it what what was not discussed should give you clues as to how well connected these people are to the people. And I say that not to fully blame the candidates. The candidates are asked what they're asked, and they respond to it. They can talk about whatever they want. Actually, they could respond to a question about climate change with an answer about inflation if they wanted to. But I think it is telling that there was uh, there was no direct question about inflation itself from the moderators. And when you look at poll results, uh, that's the one issue that everybody cares about uh, over all others. Mm -hmm. So a court, uh, leading into the debate, an economist YouGov poll found that um, 25% of Americans say inflation is the top issue facing the country. That's more than twice the next closest answer of climate change at 11%. Healthcare, 10%. Jobs in the economy, which is closely related to inflation, 10%. 75% of respondents said the issue of inflation is very important. Inflation is also the top issue among That's independents. It? 75% of respondents? And another 21% said somewhat important. So oh, everybody okay, agrees well, it's either somewhat or very important or very important. Okay, yeah, fine. Um, and but it's very important to independence as well. Twenty six percent of them say it's the most important issue. So it's it's not just important in terms of how it's harming the average American's wallet. Politically, it's also very important because according to independence, that's going to sway them in their decision making. And so it got almost no direct mention on Wednesday night. According <laughs> to Market Watch, the word only came up six times in passing. Now, of course, you might talk about similar issues without using the word inflation, but uh, other proxy issues were similarly infrequently mentioned. Gasoline, costs or prices or groceries. These things were all very low on the list of words mentioned. 
by comparison, Ukraine was mentioned 23 times. And that was one of the bigger fights between Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy was uh, how much money do you give to Ukraine? And in fairness to Ramaswamy, his position was stop, which uh, at least someone was voicing that position. There are a couple of debate points I do want to discuss. One is a little more serious. One is uh, one is just pure entertainment. But uh, I don't want to overstate this moment. Um, most polling I've seen shows GOP voters who viewed the debate saying DeSantis was the night's top performer. But I do think this moment of hesitation to raise his hand saying he hesitated to to raise his hand to say whether or not he would support Trump if Trump is convicted. I think that was a pretty weak moment uh, and not because he has to say, yes, I will support Trump or no, I will not support Trump. It's just a moment in which he looked very indecisive. And yes, DeSantis had a response explanation to this, which we'll get to in a moment. But in case you missed it, the question was, by show of hands, would you support Trump as the Republican nominee, even if he was convicted of a crime? And DeSantis hesitated and looked around and then raised his hand Uh, a few moments after some of the other candidates raised theirs. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. Okay. Nah, I I kind of take no issue with this. It was his response to it. Okay, well... I, I, I do have to uh, to play his response. He, he offered an explanation on Friday. He told reporters he wasn't waffling on the question of whether he'd support Trump if Trump is the nominee because he says he's already signed a pledge to do so. He says before the debate, the candidates in his mind agreed not to do this raise your hand game, or at least that was his impression. And then when everyone was doing the raise your hand game, he was confused because he thought nobody was going to do that. Do you hesitate for raising your hand to commit to backing Trump? Yeah, and it wasn't because of that. I, I, I signed that pledge. I will follow the pledge. I mean, 100%. I, I objected to doing the hand raise, and I thought most of the candidates seemed to agree with me. And so I was like, okay, are we really doing this? And people are doing it. So I, I made the pledge. I will follow through with the pledge. I don't sign pledges and not follow through. I don't think he would be the nominee at that point, but it, I signed the pledge, and that's just the reality of the situation. What? I don't know. He seemed to... I think that make, made him seem weak and indecisive yeah, and that, like he's looking to others to make his his decisions, which is a very undesirable quality in a leader. That's the whole problem with it. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's not you have to have this position or that position. It's the it's the looking around at others for cues. Mm-hmm. And even I guess if I take his what he's saying there at its best. I thought we had an understanding that we weren't going to do the hand raising game. It would have been better for him just to say that plainly like guys, what are we doing? I thought we weren't going to do this or something. (laughs) Instead, he's still okay though. I bet we weren't going to do this. Yeah. I mean, maybe that would have come off just as badly. I don't know. But I, I guess my point is whether he's trying to assess whether the other candidates would support Trump or not, or whether he's trying to evaluate, I thought we weren't going to play this game. You guys all agreed. He's still looking at others for cues to guide his response, which is a very, Mm -hmm. uh, it's an undesirable characteristic in a leader. Um, And I'm not saying that everybody has to have the the right answer about everything all the time. All of these problems are complicated and you have to think through them and you have to sort through those first principles to get the right answer. But a, a couple things on that. Number one, this was not like some shock out there question that was bizarre that maybe you'd never thought about, like some weird hypothetical to really challenge your principles. This was a pretty basic statement about whether you'll support the party's candidate regardless of the circumstances. You would think you'd have that uh, sorted out. And then number two, even if you are trying to sort out the uh, the, the principles of uh, a difficult dilemma, if you can't answer definitively right away, um, you you still explain your thinking on the process. Well, pr- uh, premise A, B, and C, premise D, E, and F. Uh, this is why I would reach this conclusion or lean this way, but I, I'll have to consider more about this particular topic. You still, even in that scenario, you're not looking at others to assess your response. When, even if right. you're unclear about how to answer a particular question. Um so it's not like I'm saying leadership means you're you're right all the time. You have the correct answer immediately always. 
just means you're not looking around to fit in. You are guided by Mm -hmm. your own convictions, your own principles, not by whether that other guy next to you is raising his hand. Right. Exactly. I think it was a bad look. I, I don't think it's going to matter. In fact, um, I'm probably harping on it too well, much. He's out. I mean, he's totally lost favor from the general public. Well, it seems like most people, the viewers of the debate viewed him the best. But did they view him? What the does best? that mean, though? Yeah. I mean, it, it's not like he's going to make up. At least because of this performance, it's not like he's going to make up the 40 point difference to Trump right now. So no. And it was just such a disaster. He's, you know, the hottest chick at fat camp. <laughs> it's nothing. And everybody's talking about Vivek. Vivek. Uh, Vivek. 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 I'm not saying that. Yeah. Okay, that's and enough teeth, serious stuff. White teeth. That's what I call them. And something that uh, doesn't really matter but was hilarious and entertaining. Chris Christie was booed at length because he wouldn't stop attacking <laughs> yeah. Trump. So speaking of Vivek, Mr. Ramaswamy kind of started this fight by saying, Well, hey, Chris Christie, it's really weird and kind of ironic. That you say Trump is bitter and vengeful because all you do uh, in this entire race is just be bitter and vengeful against Trump. That's the basis for your entire Mm -hmm. campaign. And so Christie went back at Ramaswamy and the crowd got into it to the point that the moderators had to actually intervene to stop the booing. And Chris Christie, honest to God, your claim that Donald Trump is motivated by vengeance and grievance would be a lot more credible if your entire campaign were not based on vengeance and grievance against one man. You make me laugh because you sit, you, sit, you sit here in an answer, you sit here in an answer right now. Hold on, sir. Go ahead, Governor Hold Christie. Hold on, Governor Christie. Hold on. Well, so listen. The more time we spend doing this, the less time they can talk about issues you want to talk about. So let's just get through this section. This is the great thing about this country. Booing is allowed, but it doesn't change the truth. It doesn't change the truth. I think Brett Baer is misreading the room. No, no, everyone is. They're not here to hear about the issues. They're here to boo Chris Christie. That's why we're here. Uh, the other side I kind of Chris- hate the lack of decorum though I think it's I think it's a little gross well I I mean uh, I'm shocked to hear you say that actually that that y- you still think- I don't know I, I can't put my finger on it but I find it a little embarrassing and distasteful if we had a country left to respect <laughs> I, I trust me I want yeah. the country of respectable institutions where I would be bothered by that I do uh, but I don't think that these people are necessarily making a mockery of the institution when they're i mean chris christie should be booed he's a fat joke but like all of these people should and this Ah. is just a trump plant and everybody's falling for it (laughs) okay do you think that he tim pool thinks he's buying for veep and i wonder if if that's what's going on i i think next to zero chance that uh ramaswamy is going to get picked uh Mm. i think that trump's going to pick a woman and i i would say that that is almost a lock well, what what if it's uh, the impetus of some other cabinet position? Uh, maybe. I mean, is is what Ramaswamy is doing? He's raising his profile. He's not. He's not mm. seriously considering a victory. I get that, but uh, I think that they're in well, cahoots, though. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Um, but but back to Chris Christie. And like I said, I just want to laugh at Chris Christie. Okay, I don't want to get into any Fine. more technical political analysis. Um. When Chris Christie says, well, hey, uh, you can boo all you want. It doesn't change the truth. I mean, that that's true. But on the other side of it, just because you're getting booed doesn't mean that you're telling the truth either. And and speaking of the truth. Yeah. All Chris Christie did is dig in those very heavy heels to <laughs> deny reality. He appeared on he appeared on oh. CNN the next morning to say, actually, they weren't booing me at all. They were saying Boo Earns congratulating me <laughs> on how I just burned Ramaswamy so bad. Boo Earns, Christy Boo earned him. That's what they were saying. Um, anyway, if you remember the old Simpsons episode, but what Chris Christie actually said was almost as ridiculous. He said everyone watching at home was just loving the Chris Christie experience. It was only the people there were booing. Everyone at home was cheering him on. Let's start out with your best moment. What was your best moment last night? Telling the truth about Donald Trump. I'm proud of the fact that I was the only one last night 
who was willing to do it repeatedly and directly. Why do you think that was your best moment to get Republican primary voters to vote for you when you had really loud boos every time you did that? Well, because not every Republican primary voter in America was in the arena. <laughs> um, and because you can't be looking to play to the grandstand, Poppy. Okay. What I was doing was talking to the people, the tens of millions of people who were watching mm -hmm. um, in their living rooms, in their family mm -hmm. rooms at home. The fact is, if you're not going to talk about that, then 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 why so, bother running? You so, should just concede the race to Donald Trump, which is what a lot of those people did on the stage last night. This is clearly a personal vendetta, though. Uh, yeah. I was saying boo Ern. <laughs> uh, now, I will grant his point that if you're on that stage and you're not drawing a distinction between yourself and Trump, you do have to explain why you're running. And I do think that's yeah. true for okay. several candidates. Yeah, yeah. So fair point there. But that also extends to Chris Christie. Explain to me why you're running. Because uh, for other people, I get it. As you mentioned with Ramaswamy, it's a it's a raising of the profile thing. Maybe it is some sort of audition to be in a future Trump administration, whatever. DeSantis clearly thought that there was a lane for him to be competitive, may have miscalculated, but I understand why he's there. Most plausible guy outside of Trump, most likely, although Vivek is somewhat surging, you know, uh, but for everybody that likes him a lot, there are people who hate him stylistically, too. So we'll see where that goes. What is Chris Christie's angle? Everybody hates him. And it seems like everybody he's trying to be him, yeah. hated more. According to the 538 polling, he has the worst unfavorability of any candidate in the field. They did some polling about favorability and unfavorability before and after the debate. 61% unfavorable for Chris Christie. Dude. Now he did move some people from no opinion to favorable during the debate, but after the debate, Ooh. he was still at 61% of Republican voters still hate him. And the only person even close to being as hated as Chris Christie uh, in the race is, uh, is Mike Pence. But even Mike Pence with a somewhat controversial debate performance himself, even he reduced his unfavorables during the debate, bringing 57% unfavorable down to 54 the only le the only thing in fairness I can say to Chris Christie is that Asa Hutchinson may have really outperformed in terms of the relative hatedness. Hutchinson started the debate with only 23 percent unfavorable. And then he said hardly anything at all. But what he did say, and remember, this is the guy from Arkansas, the governor who you know, made the conservative case for child gender transitions and all that, and then got mm -hmm. pretzeled up by Tucker Carlson at that event a few weeks ago. When he was talking about transgender, quote unquote, treatment and Tucker was saying, well, if you call it treatment, don't you grant the premise that like a, a man can become a woman? And, that right. sort of, and he, he paused for about 10 seconds and tried to worm his way out of it. That guy, Asa Hutchinson, started the debate with 23 percent unfavorable. By the end, he had doubled it up to 47 percent unfavorable. Now, in, in terms of the growth of the hate. Hutchinson was actually the most hated candidate of the night. But in terms of the raw amount of hate, the largest amount of hate goes to the similarly large Chris Christie. So why is he here other than for my entertainment? I hope he doesn't quit anytime soon, personally. I don't know. I think he's trying to establish some sort of redemption arc. <laughs> Good luck. It was all downhill for him after that beach incident. Uh, yeah. Was that? Yeah. That was, that, uh... It was just such bad not man of the people PR like bourgeois unrelatable fat man nonsense and then after that everybody hated him and so I think in his mind he's like I'm going to be the hero that the American people need I'm going to be the anti-Trump and and I, I think he has delusions of grandeur I, I don't know what he could possibly be getting out of this financially everybody hates his guts well say what you will about Chris Christie he was just a few years ahead of the beach closures if only he was in California in 2020 then he would have been really popular you know, when was this? That was back. That was when he was governor. That must have been the beach closure thing. Must have been. I want to say like 2012 or something. Uh, Chris, God, was it that long? Ago? It was a while ago. Maybe I'm saying too early. I think but it, was it was like 2014, you know, 15, maybe. Oh, it was later. I'm I'm off. You're right. It's it was 2017. Okay. I know uh, that it was pre COVID. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it definitely was on it. Yeah. It was totally uninvolved with Corona beach closures, but um, why were the beaches closed? Something to do with the, there was a, a close. Uh, I think it was a government shutdown of New Jersey state government or something like that. 
So Let's all see. public beaches were closed. Uh, it was a budget impasse. Yeah. Well, Governor defended using a, a state park that is closed to the rest of the state's residents due to a budget impasse. That's why it was closed. Anyway, uh, got to keep it moving because we got plenty left to talk about. I want to talk about Victor Shokin here and I want to leave enough time for our hoax hate too. Um, but as long as this uh, Biden Ukraine scandal has been developing, I've been wondering where exactly is Victor Shokin? Victor Shokin is the former Ukrainian prosecutor general who was investigating the energy company Burisma, for which Hunter Biden served on the board. Shokin was fired in 2016, as Joe Biden famously described, because Biden demanded it as a term for Ukraine getting a billion dollars in U.S. aid. Well, son of a bitch, he got fired. That famous moment that's about Victor Shokin. And it has long been alleged that Victor Shokin was corrupt, and that's why he was fired. But why do we never hear from Victor Shokin? Because he's not dead. I think someone tried to mercury poison him at some point, but he's not dead. They I, did. Th- I think That's everybody right. in Russia I think or it was Ukraine, arsenic. Yeah, maybe something. It's like if you're in that part of the world, you get <laughs> some kind of poisoning. That's just a, it's a rite of passage. But uh, he's just an old retired man somewhere in Ukraine. So why isn't anybody talking to him? Why can't we hear his side of the story? Well, now we are hearing some of his side of the story. Fox News actually got him to interview with Brian Kilmeade this week. Excuse me. And he affirmed all the basic accusations of the case. Yes, former Ukrainian President Poroshenko fired Shokin at the direction of Joe Biden Yes, Joe and Hunter Biden were engaged in bribery, at least in his opinion. Why were you fired from your position by President Poroshenko? Poroshenko fired me at the insistence of the then Vice President Biden because I was investigating Burisma. So did President Poroshenko tell you that, that he wanted you to stay on the job, but there was pressure from Vice President Biden? There were no complaints whatsoever, no problems with how I was performing at uh, my job, but because pressure was repeatedly put on President Poroshenko, that is uh, what ended up in uh, him firing me. Do you believe that Joe Biden or Hunter Biden got bribes? I do not want to deal in unproven facts, but my firm personal conviction is that yes, this was the case. They were being bribed. The fact that Joe Biden gave away $1 billion in uh, U.S. uh, money in exchange for my dismissal, my firing, isn't that alone a case of corruption? Okay. Uh, of course, it wasn't just the fact that uh, the Shokin firing happened in exchange for the USAID, which he's talking about there, uh, which did, of course, greatly benefit the company that Hunter Biden was working with, Burisma. It's also the fact that, as you'll recall uh, from, from a few weeks ago, a reliable FBI source provided an entire report to the FBI detailing how Burisma executives paid Joe and Hunter Biden $5 million each to exert the pressure on the Ukrainian government to get Shokin fired to take the heat off of Burisma. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just improperly dangling U.S. money for personal gain, which Shokin is talking about there. I'm Joe Biden. I control the billion dollars in USAID, and you're going to do something that personally benefits me and my son in exchange for the delivery of that aid. It was personal enrichment, too, in the form of millions of dollars from Burisma, according to that established uh, FBI source deemed reliable for over a decade by the Bureau. But 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 Shokin, Shokin was the corrupt one. That's what we're supposed to believe about all this. Well, uh, there was a matter of U.S. policy to get Shokin fired because he was corrupt. Well, number who was setting U.S. policy in Ukraine at the time? It was Joe Biden. And as far as the international community believing he should be fired, I have to imagine Joe Biden was influential within the international community as well. And then, and then there's just the question of if you if you say he's corrupt, what did he do that's corrupt? This question came yeah. up a few weeks ago. So I read a little bit more about it during show prep today. And I'm reading a story in USA Today in 2019, back when um, uh, Trump was impeached for his improper Ukrainian phone call. And uh, according to the story, quote, uh, it was because Shokin. So why was Shokin fired? 
It was because Shokin wasn't pursuing corruption among the country's politicians, according to a Ukrainian official and four former American officials who specialized in Ukraine and Europe. So notice the uh, the flexibility of the accusation here. And, and Shokin is corrupt. Shokin's a bad guy. He does corrupt things. Well, the accusation actually was he doesn't do enough to stop corrupt people. According to who? Anonymous sources. About whom? <laughs> Anonymous corrupt people. Not quite, but close. You read further down in the story. Who are these corrupt people that he was supposed to be going after? Okay, well, back in 2015, uh, he was involved in the investigation of some prosecutors in Ukraine in a case in which they discovered uh, a bunch of money and a bunch of diamonds that these prosecutors had, which led to a suspicion that they were accepting bribes. They were called the diamond prosecutors. For one reason or another, that case fell apart. It was not prosecuted. His deputy, Shokin's deputy, who was going to investigate it, resigned months later, and he accused the prosecutor's office of being a hotbed of corruption. But there's really no specifics here other than the case was not pursued. Now, is it suspicious that maybe some prosecutors have a pile of money and diamonds? Maybe. Are you, <laughs> if you're a prosecutor, yeah. <laughs> might you also be wealthy and own diamonds? Yes. So I'm going to need a little more detail on the nature of that corruption accusation. And then I love this one. Well, what else did he do that was corrupt? Well, he stepped in to help Zlochevsky. Oh, I remember that name. Who's that? Oh, he's the head of Burisma. What did he do to help Zlochevsky? Oh, well, Zlochevsky was being investigated by British authorities and um, Shokin did not turn over evidence to those British authorities to have him prosecuted there. <laughs> okay. Well, wait. So he was fired. You fired him for going after Burisma aggressively. And part of your evidence is, well, he was he was helping Burisma too much. Well, then why don't you let him go after Burisma? Or if the problem is he yeah. didn't, he was too light on Burisma before. Now he's going hard on Burisma and you fire him anyway for being too light on Burisma like X amount of years ago. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, if this, if this sounds silly and it sounds, uh, if there are a lot of red flags in this explanation. Yeah. I mean, consider the, consider the ultimate red flag of the allegations against the Bidens are much more detailed and have much more evidence than the allegations of corruption against Vist Victor Shokin. The best they have on Shokin is, he didn't do enough. He didn't go after people hard enough. Is that itself corruption? Or is that just a prosecutor that you would say has maybe misaligned priorities or maybe even a prosecutor who's just bad at his job? I, I, it could be as simple as that. But there are a lot of plausible explanations there beyond corruption. In the case of Joe and Hunter Biden, their, their explanations beyond corruption are dwindling and or absent entirely. <clears throat> so right, they really aren't making an effort with that in that regard are they no they just point the finger well yeah. oh, that guy's corrupt source trust me bro okay i i hope that shokin speaks more i hope that uh you know those congressional investigators are able to talk to him and and all the i i there's he's got to know more about this story mm -hmm. anyway uh time for hoax hate if you're ready i am all right And now, the nobody saw it happen, but it's totally a product of Trump's America hoax hate crime of the week. Ah, shit, it's backwards. You think they'll notice? Well, here is a new one, a hate weed spraying. I have never heard of an anti-gay roundup attack, but here it is. And I'm reading the headline. This is in uh, Clay County, Missouri. This is northeast of Kansas City. The town's name is Clay Como. Clay Como man claims he was sprayed by weed killer in alleged hate crime. He is the Clay Como homo. That's what his nickname shall be. The Clay Como homo says he was attacked with the old roundup. Okay. Uh, so, so in Clay Como, this guy's name is Brian Bosch. And he says for years, he has requested that the city not apply weed spray to his sidewalk or his section of the boulevard. Because he maintains that area himself, and he does not want to subject himself or his dogs or his plants to hazardous chemicals. And indeed, it sounds like for years, the uh, the the public workers who take care of this weed spraying, they have uh, honored his request and they have not applied weed spray to his property. He says that was all fine until about two weeks ago, he was taking care of his lawn. 
when the Clay County weed sprayer guys drove by and sprayed him with this herbicide and called him an anti-gay slur as well. I don't know what that was. Was it the Clay Como Homo? Was it just your standard faggot? Uh, Not clarified in this story. But he caught the attack on his ring camera. There's footage of it. Walk along up and down our section of of yard and sidewalk, and I just look to make sure there's no weeds along the road or along the sidewalk. It's something Brian Bosch has been doing for many years, so the special roads district in the village of Clay Como doesn't have to spray his area down. For the past five years, I've asked them, please do not spray my yard. Please do not spray the sidewalk. I pull the weeds myself. I have small dogs. They've killed our grass the past five years. They've killed our flowers the past five years. I don't want my dogs dying. But Bosch says that all changed about two weeks ago. His ring doorbell camera caught the moment he says he was pulling weeds on his property when the special roads district crew came by and sprayed him from head to toe with the weed killer. I thought, why did this happen? Why why did this happen all of a sudden? We reached out to the city of Clay Como, who then referred us to the Clay Como police chief. The police chief says he was aware of the police report filed by Bosch and says local prosecutors declined to file charges. Bosch believes this was a hate crime. He says a homophobic slur was used by one of the crew members. He says the special roads district is also aware that he's disabled. I have systemic lupus. I have myasthenia gravis, a neuromuscular disease. I have a genetic neuromuscular disease that's extremely rare called sarcoma re tooth. How's it going to affect all of this stuff? If one of these chronic issues happens in five to 10 years, I need somebody to make sure that it's going to be taken care of by these people. Uh, he notably uh, I can't did not I say this, but I, if this happened to me, I'd be so fucking pissed. I'd be so pissed. Um, yeah, well, I can see why you might be upset. You know, I, I, I get that. I, I'm not saying he has no, no right to be. Um, I noticed this his long, he's a homo though. His long list of diseases excluded AIDS. I was shocked <laughs> to see that. Yeah. Uh, and about. so this guy who's very concerned about uh, exposure to corporate designed chemicals, how many shots and or boosters do you think he took? All of them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I would be that's that's the bet that I would make. Um, but I, all of that is is beside the important point, of course. Um, I need to see a better layout of the property. Now, it appears that y- you can see the guy is kneeled down behind some kind of mailbox or some other object when the weed sprayer guys are driving by. So I, I, I strongly suspect this case is as simple as the weed sprayer guys not seeing him, even if they should have, I'm sure yeah, they saw him. Man, the, they saw him. You they're think ju- they intentionally pit- sprayed him? Totally. You they're think pissed so? off that this, that this faggy dude is all up their ass about them spraying weed killer. So it's legit. Him. Or it's not that he was yeah, gay. It's, it's, not, it's not, that, not. It's not that he's gay. It's, it's not that because he's, it's the Louis C.K. douchebag. Right. It's the Louis C.K. bit. It's, it's not that he's gay. It's that he was yeah. being a faggot. He was being a fag. <laughs> okay. I think this is legit. Oh, man. I'd be so mad, though. I I Because I think it's probably just two guys doing their boring weed spray drive. They're talking shit about whatever. They're not paying attention. They're listening to music, whatever they're doing. And even though they should notice this guy kneeled behind a mailbox or whatever it is, you're just not paying full attention. And that happens. That's what I think happened here. Uh-uh. You, you're saying he was, he, he pissed them off enough that they did it intentionally. All right. And then they did that and they were like, got him. All right. Uh, fair enough. Now, do you believe him that an anti-gay slur was uttered? Do you think they called? No. That's, no? That's you think bullshit. that was made up? Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe my my sense is off and maybe there's more legitimacy to this than uh, I initially thought, because we have to do one of the. I don't know if this is a correction, like, we, uh, but our our suspicions from last week about how this Lake Arrowhead pride flag shooting it appears that that was incorrect. Boy, I was wrong. I thought there's no way this guy just got mad about a pride flag and shot this lady dead. There's got to be more to the story. But it kind of sounds like that's what happened. According to video evidence that they won't show us. There is some video evidence. Apparently they had some sort of previous dispute. So for those of you that don't remember, um, there was this uh, chick who in her, she had an excessive number of pride flags. And this guy, the whole storefront. Yeah. Yeah. I kept taking him down, kept, and then they got into some dispute and he, uh, he shot her. And apparently in the video footage that I've not seen, he holds up the gun and then he's like, I'm not going to do this, you know, and then he puts the gun down 
And I think she's still yelling at him. And then he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to kill you. And then he, so he like took a second to reconsider. Um, but yeah, that, that seems to be what happened. Now, the only thing that we were right about is that he's not white. Because I knew if he were white, they would immediately release the footage. But he is Japanese. He's son of a cop also. I'm surprised he, he didn't these, go like, with, the, with the samurai sword. It's just crazy. His name is Tra- Travis Ekaguchi. But I think he um, changed his last name t- because he hated his father, his cop father. Okay. He has all sorts of social media history where, it, ironically, and, and he reposted a, a burning of a pride flag. Um, and he was on Gab. So there's a lot of information from him on Gab. Um, so hold on. Where's this part about his troubled life? Okay. More details have emerged about the killer's troubled life and fringe views. He was a son of a Florida, Florida highway patrol trooper, but wrote often about his mistrust of law enforcement and even considered killing a cop. And then he said, I know it's controversial for me to mention the option to kill a police officer. But these police officers are not servants for the people and they're servants for the laws he wrote in 2021, I think on Gab. Um, it was a lot of political stuff on uh, on his socials. So I think that what happened here was that he was just kind of a man on on the edge. He was one of these, um, uh, you know, left out of society men. Hated his dad hated law enforcement, was totally fed up with LGBTQ mobs. And then this lady, it was like the last straw. It was like representative to him of all of the stuff that he hated about this country. And he's like, I'm going to kill this bitch. No, he was fed up. All right. I'll grant you that. Fed, 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 fed. No, I don't think so. I I think this is probably, uh, I think this one probably is legit too. Um, Yeah. It sounds like there was... Uh, some sort of ongoing conflict where he would return to the property and tear down the flags routinely. And if he's doing that routinely, it does make sense that there would be some hostile confrontation over that. And whether he presented a weapon, she presented a weapon. It sounds like it was just him based on the investigation so far, but I could see how that would create a physically hostile scenario in which something like a gunshot could happen. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, that is, this is, a case of legit hate, I guess. And uh, I will have, I have to circle back and declare us fake news from last fake week. News. You are fake news. But you know, that's like one out of uh, a thousand, one every couple of years, one of these comes around. Anyway. It wasn't, to- we weren't totally wrong. It wasn't a white guy. Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I thought there's no way like Japanese is so white adjacent. The right? substance of the claim that this was simply a conflict over a pride flag. I is true. Yeah. I reject it. I thought there's gotta be more to it than just that, but it sounds oh, like so there was I, not yeah. more to it than just that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Time for the movie review. I'm going to be extra careful. So I don't accidentally hit my rating button. Like I did last week. Here's the intro. In a world of movie references flying over his head. One man will finally watch them. This is the Matt and Blonde Show movie review. This week's movie is the 1985 Western Silverado in which a band of misfit cowboys assembles and then splits up and then reunites and then splits up again and then reunites again. And this continues perpetually while they fight various generic bad guys in a small frontier town. From movie picker J.G. Henry, this is my favorite Western, which says a lot because there are so many good Western movies that I love. It has an incredible deep cast, and there are so many stories within this movie. It has one of the best opening scenes for a Western, and the music works well. This movie has everything a good Western must have. Lots of gunfights between good guys and bad guys as far as Jamie and Jeannie's AI art for the week. There you have it. Uh, I I don't expect that I will earn a hit piece for digital blackface, but, you know, if someone out there wants to do me the honor, and if you ever wondered what I would look like if I were mixed with Danny Glover, there's your answer. Yeah, looks like a white black guy. (laughs) I look kind of like, what's his face from Tropic Thunder? Uh, I already (laughs) forgot his name. Um, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, okay. So as always, your uh, your review and your rating. Okay, um, I like a good western. 
By that, I mean a good Western. Mm. Good. <laughs> People are going to hate me. Okay. This wasn't a terrible movie. I'm not saying I hated it. But it suffered from all of these same issues that happen when you have a, a really ambitious director. Um, the plots, it, it's too complicated. Like half the movie, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Um, there were too many characters. And the characters that I was invested in, they were they were underdeveloped. Like I wanted to know more about them and then like less about all these people I didn't give a shit about. Um, but there were some intense shootouts that I enjoyed. And like, I was somewhat attached to some of the characters, uh, but mostly it just didn't happen for me. It was also quite long and it wasn't really worthy of that epic status. And then there was some propaganda in there. There were some like, oh, there are so many black cowboys and everybody was so racist to these black cowboys. I'm like, I fucking get it. And then like the idea that Jeff Goldblum is going to come in there and be like some, I'm a slick cowboy. I'm like, uh, you're a nerdy Jewish guy. You're not pulling one over on me. Stop casting Jeff Goldblum. Everybody. Stop. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, as much as I think Jeff Goldblum is, is as perfectly cast for the role of Dr. Ian Malcolm in Jurassic Park as could possibly be, he is one of those actors that's like, you're just Dr. Ian Malcolm. That's who you are. Yeah. Even a decade before that in this Western, you're still Ian Malcolm. I still need you to tell me how life uh, finds a way because that's the only thing you can do. It's the only thing you're good for, Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> well, yeah. He just... I'm not... Uh, as as much as I like him in that role, he he is a guy where it's like you you're just that like you're the same character even when you're a completely different character. Outside of him, I, I you know the casting was kind of fine. I mean Roseanne Arquette as the as the love interest, I was like her upper face is so long. You know, just... Don't get me started on that. Oh really? I don't know. I gave it a three out of five. I, it, this was not a bad movie. But it just didn't, you know, scratch my Western itch in the same way that those old Clint Eastwood movies did. You know? We're in a very similar spot here. Are you finished before I I don't mean to. I'm, yeah. Okay. Kevin Costner was so hot. Though. <laughs> We're in a uh, not necessarily on that point. Uh, <laughs> not that I'm We're in agreement. <laughs> trying to take shots at Kevin Costner, but uh, or maybe I should based on some of his recent political behavior and his delaying of the Yellowstone finale that I want to see anyway, or at least the end of this particular season. Uh, we're in a very similar, we have a very similar perspective here for, I think um, a lot of similar reasons. So uh, the things I can appreciate, it actually did have a great start. I, I kind of, I was into that straight the to the action, yeah. cool, clever gunfight. you got this great Western scenery I'm thinking, all right, th I think this is going to be awesome. And I, I appreciated that be specifically because I bitched about Contact having that insanely long intro that was annoying last week. And this was refreshing in comparison. Thank you. Straight to the action. I appreciate that. And y you mentioned Clint Eastwood Western classics. Now, I have been, I loved the Outlaw Josie Wales. That was a five. I gave The Good, The Bad, That's and The Ugly man. a three, even though there were some things I really liked about it because it's just one of those million-year-long old movies among some other criticisms. But now that I watch movies like this, I think like maybe I need to go back and revise that up, even though I don't do that. But anyway, straight to the action. Great start. Wish the rest would have followed. In in mm. Not that it lacked action, but just... In excellence, I wish the rest of the movie would have After followed. about 40 minutes, I was like, uh, no. I loved the the underwear uh, showdown or the underwear standoff. And I, I like the, the action of it and the shootout in his underwear and the bullet hole and his butt flap and all that. That was all great. Yeah. But I also just loved the scene of just like an apparently crazy man going into a gun store and just being like, give me that gun now. And having very few questions asked of him other than uh, despite his urgency and despite him being in underwear and seeming crazy. Uh, the only question being, do you have the money sufficient for this purchase? And, um, you know, I, I look at uh, the crazies in our country and, and indeed even in the stories tonight. And you think, are there risks associated with a country like that? Yeah, probably. Uh, do those risks exceed the risks of giving more power to the ATF? Certainly not. So I just... I long for an America where one could purchase a gun in a similar way or like, you know, buy a Tommy gun through the Sears catalog type stuff. And even if that sounds like a crazy point, well, how was justice achieved in this particular story? 
It wasn't because the sheriff did it, let alone the feds came into town and found that horse thief. It's because this guy was armed and took care of the injustice himself. And I appreciate that point. Uh, even though like, like there was a part of my brain that was watching all this, all the action in this movie and thinking like, that is, uh, that is ridiculous. Like you hid in a <laughs> jacket, like this is the little rascals and punched him in the face to knock him out. And that's how you broke. Okay. Um, when I think it was Emmett, I couldn't go back and find this scene cause I couldn't find it on YouTube and my rental had expired, but I think it was Emmett shooting Mal, Danny Glover's character, He's like trying to warn him about an approaching attacker. So he almost blows his head off. Like he shoots like a foot away from. Yeah. The, great way to warn your friend. Better aim uh, very precisely. So yeah. you don't hit him in the face. Uh, there was the double shot. Kevin Costner's character, Jake, with like that double shot on those two guys outside of the saloon. It's just like all these things. I'm thinking like, OK, that's that's really silly and kind of dumb. But I'm not going to be the kind of guy who's going to sit here and say, well, actually, the, the likelihood of making that shot would be almost impossible. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. The point is the silliness. I think my critical point on this is like silly action can only take you so far. Is, is it entertaining? Yeah. yeah, that's fine. But I'm not going to sit there lost in thought about silly action. Uh, and and those are the things that that earn some higher marks for me, even if I appreciate the entertainment value of the silly action. Now, as far as things I did not like, I'm in full agreement with you. Too many characters, too much going on, lacking a clear purpose or message, constantly asking, who is that? What is his relationship to this person? What is he doing? Where? Why? Yeah. And when you okay, ha- I, th- I was like, am I just dumb? But apparently this was a problem with the film. Even by the like, I don't even understand why everyone is going to Silverado. In the end, I don't even understand why two of them are going to California. I don't understand what the purpose of this journey is. And I I think it's fair to question who is even the main character of this story. You got really the four guys. You got Emmett, Payton, Jake, or Mal. If your answer is all of them. Okay, but that still has a problem. Because they have these four independent stories that kind of weave together, but uh, but also diverge. And so when you have four main characters with independent stories, they just kind of cancel each other out. Anything that's interesting yeah. about one is diluted by the others. And it sounds like that's something that, that you thought in your experience with it as well. I was actually really disappointed in the ending duel between Payton and Cobb. I thought it was about as boring and predictable as possible. No suspense, no mystery, no twist. It's just good guy shoots bad guy and that's it. And I do understand this movie's 30 years old uh, or almost 30 years old at this. No, almost 40 years old at this point. My math is terrible. It's an old movie. But as I mentioned earlier, we had much better standoffs in movies that we've just reviewed. The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, Mm -hmm. The Outlaw Josie Wales. I haven't seen all the Westerns around, but I guarantee you there are movies of similar age or older that have better stand, uh, better duels, better standoffs, better combat moments than that, or better kind of final fight moments than that. Maybe it's unfair to compare everybody to Clint, but um, if you want the high wikis, I think that's, that's the, that's the benchmark. And then this romance story, dude, like what is going on with this bitch, Hannah? You got, you got Payton like expressing interest in her, but she's like, no, I want to work hard on a homestead. And Payton's like, oh, I don't want a chick who wants to work hard because reasons or something. And then uh, in the end, Emmett is going to California, but it seems like she and Emmett are really warm and Payton's just standing there not caring. But then Emmett yeah. just goes to California anyway, so they don't even have a romance. And then who romance. was that guy that she was with in the beginning? Also? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I I just don't know. I don't know what she's there for. I was like, that's I, her husband, right? And then I was like, is that her brother? I don't get it. I don't get any of it. And the whole thing, as I wrote in the review, came off to be like Mormon Jerry Springer. It's like the most boring love triangle of all time. Yeah. It's like, oh, she glanced at this guy, but then he glanced at her. But then everybody just went home and nothing happened anyway. That black chick was a real smoke show, though. Uh, Mal's she's sister. Prostitute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know my theory, maybe Emmett and Payton both hit it and quit it because it was so insufferably dull. They'd rather take their chances with the cacti. <laughs> that's how, that's how boring she is. Uh, uh, so I ended up giving it the same rating that you did. It is no a way. three wiki 
production. I don't hate it, but it's not great. Okay! I'll allow it. I think it's some decently entertaining Western action. If that's what you want to just enjoy some popcorn and some old school Western action for a while, that's fine. But the plot is such a chore to keep track of, and it doesn't really lead to anywhere interesting in the end anyway. Okay, good. So, I was kind of worried that you were going to love this and I was going to. No, it didn't give me, it didn't give me much to think about in any meaningful way at all. So three wiki. Okay, uh, next week, uh, I've never seen it space balls, but of course I've seen most things star Wars. So this will be interesting. Um, and then uh, after that, we have remaining nominations for September from listener. The house always wins. Those are master and commander, the far side of the world, the hunt for red October, the dark Knight, Dune, the 2021 movie, the day after tomorrow, hot shots, fury, or of course you can reject the list in favor of a randomly selected top rated movie instead. And if you'd like to read my movie reviews, comment how wrong I am, submit your own rating, vote for the next movie and, or sign up for the chance to be the movie nominator for the month. The one and only place to do it is in my weekly movie review column linked in the description and on the homepage of the website. That is Matt Christensen media.com or Matt is dot gay slash whatever you want to write. All right. It means whatever. Literally anything. Okay. Uh, that'll do it. We'll uh, catch up with our chatters. We'll call it an evening. Uh, let's see. Does uh, my, did my rumble thing go haywire or maybe we're just caught up? Yeah, it looks like we're good on rumble. At least my system is saying we're good. So if there were additional chats on rumble, let me know. I apologize if I missed them because sometimes that system goes a little weird, but, uh, Dixon Matthias. Yeah. Wait, what was that? I know it's not so close that I feel like I can't say it. Can you say it once more? Dixon Matthias, but I think he was trying to get me to say that. (laughs) Matt and I once made love Regal Fregal lied and said the shave from Western razor would be smooth. Now Matt has scratchy thighs and I have a brush burn on my penis. What the? Okay. Thank you. I like that they, that they like loop in the sponsor. I'm sure our sponsors are so jazzed about this. I well, every time I I work with uh, the many listener owned businesses that we uh, work with, when those terms are negotiated, I say you're signing up for an association with a sometimes controversial product. Yeah, I hope that you true. are. You do tell them that. Yeah, of course. Like there are there okay. are risks associated with that. Might be, uh, you know, some bad actor trying to do some sort of hit piece, not just on us, but on you for your commercial association. Or it could be as simple as the degeneracy of some sexual themed super chat being associated with your product. Ah, The show makes life seem so simple. It's kind of wholesome in its own way, isn't it? I'm not sure that's the word I would use, but uh, (laughs) sure. Oh, wait for this one. Okay. Moist farts. Ah. Matt, since your review of Raiders of the Lost Ark, I've suffered from a recurring nightmare. I set up a booby trap and blonde, big ass Jew nose endlessly chases me. Any suggestions to stop the terror? Love you much, Vegas. Okay. I have pregnancy, rhinitis, and it makes my nose grow sideways. Also, because I'm fat. But it's I reject that this is that this is a Jew nose. This is, look at this. <laughs> okay. We all know it's Asian. We we have heard the the genealogy results. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Prezius. The mugshot was great, and it was amazing to see this old <laughs> TDS just coming out. These people that suffer TDS have to be careful of what they wish for. It was. It gave me a little bit of a 2015 energy, you know? I, en- I obviously enjoyed looking at them. I enjoyed all the memes as we discussed, but in ways I enjoyed... I wouldn't call them leftist memes, but I enjoyed the boomerism of their response too. just the, the various posts of people being like, oh, he's never looked so good or you know, those kind of generic, stupid insults. Like, yeah, m- even uh, even Ilhan Omar, I should have I should have put that up. Ilhan Omar tweeted out. He really is all about that thug life because <laughs> he got arrested. And I'm thinking like, wait, is this are you saying he's cool or are you criticizing him? I think yeah. she means that he's a bad guy, but also like okay. in many other contexts, you are, you support the thug life or even generically, like even if you're not a supporter of criminals as a, like a political matter, when you say someone, 
I don't know, as Trump would put it, is doing thug life. Like the, the thug life meme is is praise, you know, yeah. even if it's not a reference to specific criminality. It's like, oh, this guy is being a badass. He's Therefore, badass, the thug yeah. life sunglasses and the joint apply to him. And they're doing something that is just absolutely catastrophic to the Biden administration, which is making Trump, who is also an old fucking man, seem cool to, to young voters. Hmm. Like, how are they doing this? It's so stupid. You know what you're never going to be able to do? Make Biden seem cool. To no, Gen Z. impossible. Impossible. Yeah. Um, Spencer Marker, a big donation. Thank you so much. This is long overdue. Been a fan since you did a guest video for Sargon. Appreciate everything you both did. We appreciate you too. Oh, well, thank you. We that. love you. You're very special. Very appreciate special. that. Appreciate your kind words and for tuning in as long as you have. I have to confess, I don't even remember the video. I must have. Uh, I can't remember. Did I make something? F- Maybe Sargon did guest things, or I can't even remember it what it was. Hardcore uh, interracial pornography. That's right. He mm-hmm. posted it on his second channel. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that was. Uh, Eric, Nervous. thank you. Good Spencer. evening. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned our daughter was in the hospital after three weeks on a ventilator. She's now out and home, and I get to listen to her cry every night. So happy. Oh, what a nightmare that must have been for you, Eric. Guys. With a K. Congratulations to your family, and My thank you for your you. proper Nordic spelling. Chubby stubby. We can't see the manifestos yet. They're still writing them. Had to replace the whiteout they used to decorate the rifle. Is that what they used on that rifle? It did. It did look. Uh, it was not. It was not particularly it was well done. It did look like they took uh, that old school whiteout that you used to use in school. You know, it was like it had a little paintbrush or whatever. You know mm-hmm. that stuff. Not the strip, but the stuff that was actually like a little brush. nail polish brush. Yep, yep. Looked like maybe it was that. Uh, General Grievance, my brother Kyle and I once made an Eiffel Tower with Matt. Uh, he discovered what's gayer than taking it in the mouth of the butt. It's taking it in both at the same time. What is wrong with you guys? How would you? Oh. I don't know. Don't you call that a wobbly A? You're acting queer. Thank you. Disgusting. Uh, Jonathan Prezi, so my OMG, it looks like the FBI painted that on the AR. Wait, did I reread this? Oh, no. Somebody else just said the same thing. Yeah. I... I, I... If people have a transcription of what that text said, I would like to know. I can't even read it. Something file. Um, the but Grand I, Inquisitor. Yeah. Oh, if I'm anyone sorry, knows, I, I want to know. I live in Jacksonville. A Baker Act is a court order 72-hour involuntary mental health hold. If that did occur, he should be a prohibited person on NICS unless he was a juvenile. He was a juvenile. It was, was 2017, it said. So he yeah. would have been 16 years old or so. Wait, no. Six, he would have been 15. He was born in, yeah, he could have been 15 because he was born in 2001. Uh, Jonathan Prezios, funny thing is if Russia truly believes that they didn't bring down the plane, wouldn't they immediately be blaming Americans? The fact that they just said they are investigating it says something to me. That's true. That's true. Yeah, maybe there's some Mm. kind of uh, low level admission there. Thank you, Jonathan. Carrie Green, miss watching you guys live. Work issues, had to pop in and pay my tithe for the month. Thank you, Carrie. We appreciate it. Thank you, Carrie. I am not going to be niggardly. And all the best at work. Ryan Hass. Just wanted to thank my favorite disingenuous faggot for the outstanding content. I'll have to catch the replay, but these streams are a delight. I adore you both. Also, sorry if the joke has been running to the ground. No, I I was pretty mad about that. It has not been running to the ground. Um, Fuck that guy. All I will say is if you want to know what the disingenuous faggot reference is, go back to you go listen to the Wednesday call in show. It's on the audio you can find on the podcast page. And I think that was maybe it was sometime before the end of the first hour. So like maybe 50 minutes in or something. Uh, Is your wife complaining all the time? Thank you for changing the subject. (laughs) Um, No, I that would. That was an interesting encounter. That's all I will say about that. Thank you for uh, reviving. No, I'm Is she? Are you just getting? I'm just complaining to my husband all the time about the pregnancy. He's like, "Shut up." Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. No, my wife. Shut up, complain. bitch! Oh my God. But yeah, tell That's your actual audio from a conversation that we had earlier tonight. Tell your husband to get that button. What? Tell your husband to get that button. Just somewhere on his phone. Oh, he can play the button. It. Yeah. But you said that butt. I was like, no. oh, okay. Oil King, rock legend Alice Cooper loses cosmetics deals for calling transism a fad. Yeah, 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 I chewed it. 
Matt on the trans is a Montana state ban and jail. Yes or no. Is that true about Alex, Alice Cooper? That makes me. I don't know like, what he I said. Um, that is such a tepid statement, though. I'm not sure what exactly the last part on Montana law is, but uh, we are one of the states that passed a, a ban on the transitioning of children. Uh, in the spring and i forget when that takes effect it's sometime very soon here what montana law says is you're not going to get a medical license in this state if you're doing that and uh and so that's how it'll be handled and i i am for reasons uh, referenced in the wednesday call and show discussion um i think that that's the proper balance to make sure that we are stopping what i think is uh child abuse in the form of physically trans physically altering these kids in pursuit of a gender transition while also making sure that the state is not overly empowered to separate children and children parents, parents and start putting people in jail. I think that clearly there are some parents who are abusive and need to be separated from children, whether you're punching that kid in the face or whether you're doing all kinds of gender nonsense chopping, but there is a major danger it's kind of a weird rhyme that makes it sound silly, but there's a significant danger in going too far in giving the state power to separate child and parent. The number one thing that keeps society functioning is intact nuclear families. The number one thing that will make society fail is the disillusion of the, of the family. Am I saying that word right? The, the dissolving of the falling apart of the nuclear family. That's why I think, Montana law has struck the balance correctly. It's just, if, if you want to be a medical provider, you're not doing that shit. And, um, and we'll deal with cases of physical child abuse where they may arise elsewhere. But as far as our medical clinics, our hospitals, all that, we're not, we're not doing child gender transitions. So yeah. if you have ambition to be a medical professional in the state of Montana, not happening here. Move on. Oh, okay. Um, Ryan Spratt, man, all that water coming in at the border was pretty brown. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Ishmael was, Rivera. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Uh, trapped to the world. The Maui fire isn't like the fires in California where people lose their homes, but no one dies. He compared almost losing his luxury car to the suffering of people whose small children had just been burned alive. I know it was so disconnected I, and offensive. I was just shocked what I was hearing, even for him. Uh, yeah, and that's the thing. You're right. Keyword almost, all caps there, because, of course, he didn't even lose his... Uh, his classic car. That was not a consequence he that he yeah. in fact suffered. Um, one more than I got to reload. Okay. Tortuga says, hope you're all stocking up on beans, booze, and bullets for the big dance. Uh, well, um, I would say I'm a little low on booze, but I'm good on other supplies. So, and I think they're more necessary. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, it, it, did you read Ishmael? Thank you, Tortuga. No. Ishmael Rivera. Uh, there are two here. One was blank. So if you didn't mean to send two, Ishmael, as always, you can send me an email. Well, I can get you your money back on that. But he says, Prigozhin's death could be a Ukrainian hit. They have the motivation to go after him. Explosives are their MO. And Putin has motivation to deflect it from occurring on the Russia side of the border. Yeah, I mean that, I suppose, could make sense. We know that Prigozhin had been... Uh, had been leading the the Wagner group, which had been active in uh, on the Russian side of the conflict for, you know, as, as long as this has been going on. So maybe it is as simple as some sort of Ukrainian vengeance. Although if it was, I guess, why would Putin, if Putin knew that, maybe he just doesn't know it for sure. But if Putin knew that to be the case, wouldn't he want to emphasize that? Because that would show Ukrainian aggression outside of Ukrainian territory, which would Mm -hmm. counter everything Ukraine says, which is we don't, we don't go on. We don't make aggressive action in Russian territory. We only defend, we only defend Ukraine. If they did that and Putin knew it, it seems like something you'd want to advertise if you were him. Right. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it could be though. I, or it could be, I could, I could see that. Injured guardian. You said, damn it, blind. You skipped my super chat, but I, I went back and I didn't see anything. Uh Oh, so maybe we have some kind of error. Sorry, bud. Can you check for it? Maybe I'm wrong. Isaac Bowles. I can cert yeah, I can see. Isaac Bowles. You got me. Wait, what, what's that one? Balls. I suck balls. Oh, I, that, I, that, one's, that one's tricky. Um, yeah, Andrew Guardian. I only see the one. So if there were two, uh, let me know and I can 
search later and I can get you your money back on that. But I only see the one in our records. I, yeah, I only see the one. Um, you guys totally ignored true highlights from the debate. For example, Vivek calling out Karen's future board membership on Lockheed. Yeah, I refuse to believe that he's a, not a bad actor. I just, I'm just not convinced i'm not saying he's a bad actor um i'm saying he's, what i he, 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 he's like worth 500 million dollars from big pharma money i'm not gonna be like oh he's a man of the people <laughs> the I, whole thing i would say that of the candidates on the stage he said the most things i generally agree with but yeah but he's just jerking all of us off yeah i mean i i don't think that he's evil or something like that the reason that i didn't want to get into uh all the finer details of the debate is because Number one, it's several days back now. Number two, I don't think that any of those exchanges really matter all that much. So, like, is it is it entertaining to call Nikki Haley a war hawk? Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Sure. Um, I'm personally more entertained by laughing at Chris Christie. So, so that's what that's what I went with. Um, but, you know, you can dispute uh, my selection methods in that if you would like. You're entitled to that. Um I, there's also the greatly entertaining spectacle of them arguing about money for Ukraine. And then there was the argument about money for Israel too. And that's where it got, uh, that's where it got particularly heated. Yeah. Yep. Um, chimp in a bow tie. Every daycare is abusing your child. The worst was the mother who left her baby with Marissa tight sort who'd had her four kids removed and was shocked when she got her baby home and he was stone mm. cold. Yeah. I don't know why people think that, you can leave your child with other people and it's fine. Uh, can you? Yes. Is it a, a bet that you should take confidently? Maybe not. There are definitely risks associated with that. I'm really struggling with the school thing. I don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're thinking about, of course, we're a little bit further off from the decision than you are. But uh, we entertain, I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, K through eight nearby that would be convenient. And I entertain I entertain it maybe if if we were active parents with a lot of oversight and you know, just very a very active role in our kids education. But I was talking with another parent and he was showing me. Uh, oh, look, at here's one of the, the kindergarten teacher profiles in which she talks about how she and her partner just arrived in nope. Bozeman. And uh, just in case you think she's progressive and refers to her husband as her partner, which, to be honest, would be kind of a concern for me regardless. Um, you know, social media pictures with uh, pride flags and uh, other <gasps> no, other kind kind of nonsense. Not. So I don't know, man. Um, I got a couple I years to figure it out. Understand the argument for homeschooling, you guys. Like I I get it, but there's also an argument to sending your children to school, not necessarily public school. It's important and socially formative, and you do tap out as a parent with your ability to teach your children, especially if you have multiple children. What about the homeschool co-op? I think we might go that route. Just find a network of other parents who are homeschooling and work within that. Yeah. Um, but then you still have to drop your kid off at, at other parents' houses. Yeah. And you got to know them well, for sure. Well, even if you know them well, like a lot of my dearest friends are, are free range parents. And so what does that mean? You know, that they let their children take like risks that I would never ever allow Emline to take. Okay. Like they don't watch them around water features and things like that. Well, but okay. So I guess it, it, the, the recess time is the particular concern here, right? It, it's uh, I, I guess I would assume this yeah. would just be classroom time. Yeah, but they would be going out and doing stuff a lot, and it would be dropping them off at their houses. A lot of them live on lakes and things like that. And they don't, they don't watch their own children around God, it's a real tough time, man. Tranny propaganda or drowning. Which one am I going to pick? Yeah. Yeah. I, it's it's difficult. I mean, I think the best situation, because Emmeline's begging me to go to school all the time. Begging me. And hmm. I think the best situation is to send her to like a private Christian school. Maybe. That, of course, has its own cost, too. Or maybe you live in a state where you get a voucher or you get financial assistance to do yeah, something really. like that. But Send your donations to uh, Blind Ability Research. You know, like yeah, I mean, I don't system. know what the situation in Idaho is or not. But, uh, but yeah. I mean, in a perfect world, yeah. we They wouldn't be taking our money in the first place and we could handle these matters uh, ourselves. But if they're going to take your money, you should at least have some choice in the matter as to how that money is spent. Yeah. Uh, that would be great. Maybe in the future. Um... 
Oil King, Sam Hyde and a random delivery driver should be moderators of the GOP debate. The candidates need to do 30 squats. Gag, 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 gag. Dude, decorum is earned by taking your wig and wiping swamp. Hmm. No, I mean, the, the argument that we should have decorum, I realize how stupid all of this sounds. I'm viscerally embarrassed by this, though. I don't understand why. I want a country worthy of decorum. I'm not sure we have It's, that. it's not. I'm yeah. not saying that we are. And we yeah. should just engage in decorum. That, in many ways, is even more of a joke. But, like, you know, it's like it's like a black high school graduation at these events. I'm like, what is happening here? There's people with bull horns, air horns, and stuff. I'm like, what the fuck <laughs> is going on? I, I guess I... I, uh, I have not enough. I have not had enough attendance to know. I can only Seriously? theorize. Oh. Air, uh, yeah, Inner city I, busing. I know a thing or two. Okay. <laughs> right. yeah. Hey guys, never forget when Chris Christie left office, he had a 14% approval rate in New yeah. Jersey. His state hated him. That's right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess in fairness, it's a, it's a mostly democratic state that would be inclined to hate any Republican, but he was elected, right? He was elected yeah. and then they hated him. So something must have gone south. Um, oil guy read that. Uh, hold on, right. Hi, True Seekers. Regarding the chat question earlier, um, I don't know how anyone stands those squawk panel shows. You have something special. An occasional interview probably helps you beat the algorithm, too. Yeah, that's true. I do enjoy them from time to time, though. Except I want, you know, Pearl to burn to death in a fire. So maybe <laughs> I don't. Uh, yeah, actually, um, I will tell you obviously we're not running like a guest focused show here. Um, and a couple of things about that. I will say, uh, there are going to be some future opportunities coming in which guest stuff may be a more realistic possibility. But the other thing I'll say is I think just by the nature of the show that we have, which I'm not, I, I like having the show and the audience that we have. And that includes the audience interaction that, w- that I'm sure makes my mom wince every Sunday night. Uh, but as a consequence of that, I think there are a fair amount of guests who shy away from it. Yeah. And I have, so I've just had experiences where we've had people all but locked down. And then for one reason or another, they back out. And I think it is just, they, you know, unlike our listener owned businesses, they, they decide for one reason or another, they don't want the association and that they're, that's fine. They're within their rights. Um, I understand why, someone might deem this show not quote unquote professional enough for their presence Whatever, or something though, like that's that. That's so but lame. Yeah. But that's another reason, at least in this format, I don't really want to run a guest driven thing because number one, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. It might be great. It might be terrible. Number two, um, you're putting yourself at some level of, at some level of control of other people. Under that, if I'm relying on other people to show up for my product to work, they're not going to show up a lot. And that's a problem. Now, maybe if you're Joe Rogan or you're someone who's big and established, you have a line of of potential guests that's a mile long. I don't have that luxury necessarily. (laughs) Yeah, we don't have that. Not that we couldn't. But that is those are the several reasons as to why. uh, It's not that it's no guests. It's just it's. They guests create a lot of complications. And then the other thing I, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the, uh, or he mentions the, the panel shows that end up being the kind of the squat contest. Well, when I think about shows that I enjoy and they might be politics or they might be sports or they might be a, a variety of topics for me, um, I am there for the hosts and less commonly like shows I tune in for the guest. That's going to be a show I listen to once for that guest and probably never again. I like yeah. listening to shows where I appreciate the host and I feel like I have something regular with that host, you know? And, and so that's the kind of show that I aim to produce, at least for this particular project. That's my thinking. And that's kind of the Sunday night niche that it is. I think that's a good answer. Also, we have a good I, thing going. We're doing it for a long time. So. I want you to show up for me. That's... <laughs> You have to be here for me. It's very you important. Love yeah. me. Yeah. Um, Do it. But that's that's why. But um, but yeah, the, your point on guests is taken, and um, that's why there are some new opportunities potentially in development for that to happen. So it's yeah. it's not a door shut on that. And then any long form interviews that I want to do, I just do on my channel. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how people that do interview shows get all these people to interview them. 
Well, at some point you reach a certain level of establishment that just your show is too big of an audience for people to refuse, you know? Um, the citizen seven Hague. Oh, I just read that. Um, oil King, if California refuses to give Montana a parent child, Ah. a parent's child and refuses to assist with any other situation, what happens? I'm not sure our federal government will process the interaction between states. You know, that is one area in which I, I actually do believe in, uh, federal government power. That is to say, for this, the system of states to work, we have to have an agreement among each other that we will honor the laws of the other states. So right. in the same way, if someone commits a murder in the state of Idaho and flees across the state line to the state of Montana, it, I think there there is an obligation on the authorities in the state of Montana to at least assist in the apprehension of that criminal and bringing him back to Idaho to face justice. And that yeah. Montana, even though I am a state's rights guy, I think that Montana should face some kind of consequence if they refuse. What is refusal? Like, do they have to send their deputies to go get him now? Or do they just have to get out of the way for Idaho law enforcement to come do it here? We could talk about that. But what I'm saying is like, if, if Montana actively refused, like they had him, they knew where he was and they're not letting Idaho authorities go get him to face justice. And I know that, that there should be consequence for that. And if that's consequence on the part of the federal government, I'm actually kind of okay with that. It's strange to hear me say that, but we can't have a system where you like, I want a system of States where if you don't like the law in one state, you can leave to go to another state where you do like the law, but you can't have a system where you break the law in one state and then just go to another to avoid justice. And that's true. Whether it's in the context of, of uh, a murder or whether it's in the context of like, well, I don't like how this state, uh, what this state has to say about settling marital disputes and about how children and child custody and gender transitions and all that are going to be handled. So if I'm in Texas, for example, and dad says no to gender transition, I can just flee to Florida or to uh, California rather. And California will say, sure, step right up. Here's the clinic for little Bobby to become Brittany, even though dad in Texas says no. I think California yeah. should have an obligation to honor the laws or at least facilitate in the return of that family back to the state from which they came. Um, That's a long winded argument for federal power. What am I doing? <laughs> it's happening. Ugh. I think that's it. Do we have any more? Uh, I see one from esoterica unbound little Brown mitt. Rom- <laughs> Come on. What little Brown mitt Romney. That's what you're calling Vivek. <laughs> he is definitely like running it. for veep. Uh, he is a plant to protect the controlled opposition candidate, Donald, the J uh, and the air and, and Oh, sorry. The, this came through a little weird controlled opposition candidate uh, or he's, he's a plant to protect the controlled opposition candidate, Donald Trump, I think. And their backup. If Don actually wins, it will be impeachment this time with conviction. Wait. So Vivek is a plant of either the Democrats or the deep state or the uniparty. What's he saying? I'm, I'm not sure I follow. I'm her. willing to entertain all alternative theories but it seems uh, my guess is that he's in cahoots with trump he's doing the most for trump well that's one point of annoyance i have with him again he's the guy saying probably the most things that i agree with on that stage but i think that chris christie question is actually fair if you he said on the stage donald trump is the best president of the of this century which in fairness there haven't been very many this century Mm -hmm. but if that's true if he's the best president that we've had in that amount of time i guess are you saying you're going to be you're going to be the next best. You're going to be even better than he would be. If you have such high praise, the question remains, why are you, why are you opposing? Why are you standing in the way? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, I don't know. He doesn't really have a great answer for that. As far as I've heard. Uh, let me refresh here. It looks like we're good. I think uh, on rumble laughing boy says, dude, on the tranny thing, if you can wash it off, it's okay. If you're cutting it off, wait till you're 18. How hard is it? How hard is that to get along with? I suppose that's a fairly, uh, that's a pretty good distinction. I mean, uh, yeah. when I think about um, what the role should be bet- as far as the state and parent and child, of course, parents can teach all sorts of terrible things to their kids. And even though I, I think there are objectively wrong things to teach your kids, I recognize that the danger of saying, if you tell your kid this, we're going to raid you and separate you and put dad in prison and make your, make your kid, uh, fatherless. That's a huge problem. So I think that's a pretty fair 
line. Like in the same way, we generally don't arrest parents for teaching their kids the wrong things about religion or politics or anything else. We arrest them for punching their kid in the face. Yeah. You apply those same principles to the gender stuff. Even though I think it's wrong to tell little Billy that he could be a girl if he wanted to, we're still talking about a speech issue there. And if you start actually doing the actions of altering Billy's physiology to become a girl or anatomy, then yeah, I mean, then I think you're dealing with a much more physical crime in which the idea of state intervention or punishment is, is on more sound ground to me, more justifiable. Thank you. Laughing boy. Uh, let's see. We're good on D live as well. Thank you guys. We're good on Odyssey. Uh, all set there. Appreciate you guys over there. And quick refresh on YouTube and tippy. I think we're all set. Anything else before we call it a show? Uh, no, let's do it. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Very much appreciated. Appreciate all your contributions to the show. Your super chats, your regular chats, uh, you know, all of, uh, all of your various fact checks as we, uh, as we, uh, <laughs> carry through, uh, I don't know, getting facts about, uh, pride flag shootings and things wrong, you know, how it goes. but, uh, appreciate everybody's participation. Uh, if you are listening later on demand, thank you kindly as well for supporting the show. Uh, if you can't get enough of the show, you need more to listen to, of course, head on over to the website, check out the podcast page. You'll find the show's audio platforms with all kinds of content you might not find on YouTube. Blondes interviews, we have some extra material, including the Wednesday Night Call-In Show replay. Anything else, head on over to the website, mattchristensenmedia.com. We'll be back next Sunday, because if it's Sunday, sorry, Chuck Todd, although he's almost out now. The new lady's on her way in. We're going to have to change this. Sorry, Chuck Todd. If it's Sunday, it's not me. The press, it is. The Matt and Blanche. Right. Right.